Chapter 45 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 45. The Hunted. In the dim light shed by the moonbeams sifting through the thick foliage, a man wandered through the forest with slow and cautious steps. From time to time, as if to find his way, he whistled a peculiar melody which was answered in the distance by someone whistling the same air. The man would listen attentively and then make his way in the direction of the distant sound, until at length, after overcoming the thousand obstacles offered by the virgin forest in the night-time, he reached a small open space, which was bathed in the light of the moon in its first quarter. The high, tree-crowned rocks that rose about formed a kind of ruined amphitheatre, in the centre of which were scattered recently felled trees and charred logs among boulders covered with nature's mantle of verdure. Scarcely had the unknown arrived when another figure started suddenly from behind a large rock and advanced with drawn revolver. "'Who are you?' he asked in Tagalog in an imperious tone, cocking the weapon. "'Is old Pablo among you?' inquired the unknown in an even tone, without answering the question or showing any signs of fear. "'You mean the Capitan? Yes, he's here.' Then tell him that Elias is here looking for him, was the answer of the unknown, who was no other than the mysterious pilot. "'Are you Elias?' asked the other respectfully as he approached him, not, however, ceasing to cover him with the revolver. "'Then come.' Elias followed him, and they penetrated into a kind of cave sunk down in the depths of the earth. The guide, who seemed to be familiar with the way, warned the pilot when he should descend or turn aside or stoop down, so they were not long in reaching a kind of hall which was poorly lighted with pitch torches and occupied by twelve to fifteen armed men with dirty faces and soiled clothing, some seated and some lying down as they talked fitfully to one another. Resting his arms on a stone that served for a table, and gazing thoughtfully at the torches, which gave out so little light for so much smoke, was seen an old, sad-featured man with his head wrapped in a bloody bandage. Did we not know that it was a den of tulisanes, we might have said, on reading the look of desperation on the old man's face, that it was the tower of hunger on the eve before Ugolino devoured his sons. Upon the arrival of Elias and his guide, the figures partly rose, but at a signal from the latter they settled back again, satisfying themselves with the observation that the newcomer was unarmed. The old man turned his head slowly and saw the quiet figure of Elias, who stood uncovered, gazing at him with sad interest. "'It's you at last!' murmured the old man, his gaze lighting up somewhat as he recognized the youth. "'In what condition do I find you?' exclaimed the youth in a suppressed tone, shaking his head. The old man dropped his head in silence and made a sign to the others, who arose and withdrew, first taking the measure of the pilot's muscles and stature with a glance. "'Yes,' said the old man to Elias as soon as they were alone. Six months ago, when I sheltered you in my house, it was I who pitied you. Now we have changed parts, and it is you who pity me. But sit down and tell me how you got here. It's fifteen days now since I was told of your misfortune, began the young man slowly in a low voice as he stared at the light. I started at once and have been seeking you from mountain to mountain, I've travelled over nearly the whole of two provinces. In order not to shed innocent blood, continued the old man, I've had to flee. My enemies were afraid to show themselves. I was confronted merely with some unfortunates who have never done me the least harm. 
after a brief pause during which he seemed to be occupied in trying to read the thoughts in the dark countenance of the old man, Elias replied, "'I've come to make a proposition to you. Having sought in vain for some survivor of the family that caused the misfortunes of mine, I've decided to leave the province where I live and move toward the north among the independent pagan tribes. Don't you want to abandon the life you have entered upon and come with me?' I will be your son, since you have lost your own. I have no family, and in you will find a father. The old man shook his head in negation, saying, When one at my age makes a desperate resolution, it's because there is no other recourse. A man who, like myself, has spent his youth and his mature years toiling for the future of himself and his sons, a man who has been submissive to every wish of his superiors, who has conscientiously performed difficult tasks, enduring all that he might live in peace and quiet. When that man, whose blood time has chilled, renounces all his past and foregoes all his future, even on the very brink of the grave, it is because he has with mature judgment decided that peace does not exist and that it is not the highest good. Why drag out miserable days on foreign soils? I had two sons, a daughter, a home, a fortune. I was esteemed and respected. Now I am as a tree shorn of its branches, a wanderer, a fugitive, hunted like a wild beast through the forest. And all for what? Because a man dishonored my daughter, because her brothers called that man's infamy to account, and because that man is set above his fellows with the title of Minister of God. In spite of everything, I, her father, I, dishonoured in my old age, forgave the injury, for I was indulgent with the passions of youth and the weakness of the flesh, and in the face of irreparable wrong, what could I do but hold my peace and save what remained to me? But the culprit, fearful of vengeance sooner or later, saw the destruction of my sons. Do you know what he did? No? You don't know, then, that he pretended that there had been a robbery committed in the convento and that one of my sons figured among the accused? The other could not be included because he was in another place at the time. Do you know what tortures they were subjected to? You know of them, for they are all the same in all towns. I, I saw my son hanging by the hair, I heard his cries, I heard him call upon me, and I, coward and lover of peace, hadn't the courage either to kill or to die. Do you know that the theft was not proved, that it was shown to be a false charge, and that in punishment the curate was transferred to another town, but that my son died as a result of his tortures? The other, the one who was left to me, was not a coward like his father, so our persecutor was still fearful that he would wreak vengeance on him, and, under the pretext of his not having his cedula, which he had not carried with him just at that time, had him arrested by the civil guard, mistreated him, enraged and harassed him with insults until he was driven to suicide. And I, I have outlived so much shame, but if I had not the courage of a father to defend my sons, there yet remains to me a heart burning for revenge, and I will have it. The discontented are gathering under my command, my enemies increase my forces, and on the day that I feel myself strong enough I will descend to the lowlands and in flames sate my vengeance and end my own existence. And that they will come, or there is no God." The old man aroused trembling. With fiery look and hollow voice, he added, tearing his long hair, Curses, curses upon me that I restrained the avenging hands of my sons. I have murdered them. Had I let the guilty perish, had I confided less in the justice of God and men, I should now have my sons. Fugitives, perhaps, but I should have them. They would not have died under torture. I was not born to be a father, so I have them not. Curses upon me that I had not learned with my years to know the conditions under which I lived. 
but in fire and blood by my own death I will avenge them. In his paroxysm of grief, the unfortunate father tore away the bandage, reopening a wound in his forehead from which gushed a stream of blood. I respect your sorrow, said Elias, and I understand your desire for revenge. I too am like you, and yet from fear of injuring the innocent I prefer to forget my misfortunes. You can forget because you are young and because you haven't lost a son, your last hope but I assure you that I shall injure no innocent one. Do you see the wound? Rather than kill a poor quadrillero who was doing his duty, I let him inflict it. But look, urged Elias after a moment's silence, look what a frightful catastrophe you are going to bring down upon our unfortunate people. If you accomplish your revenge by your own hand, your enemies will make terrible reprisals, not against you, not against those who are armed, but against the peaceful, who as usual will be accused, and then the eases of injustice. Let the people learn to defend themselves. Let each one defend himself. You know that this is impossible. Sir, I knew you in other days when you were happy. Then you gave me good advice. Will you now permit me? The old man folded his arms in an attitude of attention. Sir, continued Elias, weighing his words well, I have had the good fortune to render a service to a young man who is rich, generous, noble, and who desires the welfare of his country. They say that this young man has friends in Madrid. I don't know myself, but I can assure you that he is a friend of the Captain General's. What do you say that we make him the bearer of the people's complaints if we interest him in the cause of the unhappy? The old man shook his head. You say that he is rich? The rich think only of increasing their wealth. Pride and show blind them, and as they are generally safe, above all when they have powerful friends, none of them troubles himself about the woes of the unfortunate. I know all, because I was rich. But the man of whom I speak is not like the others. He is a son who has been insulted over the memory of his father, and the young man who, as he is soon to have a family, thinks of the future, of a happy future for his children. Then he is a man who is going to be happy. Our cause is not for happy men. But it is for men who have feelings. Perhaps, replied the old man, seating himself. Suppose that he agrees to carry our cry even to the captain-general, Suppose that he finds in the Cortes delegates who will plead for us. Do you think that we shall get justice? Let us try it before we resort to violent measure, answered Elias. You must be surprised that I, another unfortunate, young and strong, should propose to you, old and weak, peaceful measures, but it's because I've seen as much misery caused by us as by the tyrants. The defenceless are the ones who pay. And if we accomplish nothing? Something we will accomplish, believe me, for all those who are in power are not unjust. But if we accomplish nothing, if they disregard our entreaties, if man has become death to the cry of sorrow from his kind, then I will put myself under your orders. The old man embraced the youth enthusiastically. I accept your proposition, Elias. I know that you will keep your word. You will come to me, and I shall help you to revenge your ancestors. You will help me to revenge my sons, my sons that were like you. In the meantime, sir, you will refrain from violent measures? You will present the complaints of the people. You know them. When shall I know your answer? In four days send a man to the beach at San Diego, and I will tell him what I shall have learned from the person in whom I place so much hope. If he accepts, they will give us justice, and if not, I'll be the first to fall in the struggle that we will begin. Elias will not die. Elias will be the leader when Capitan Pablo fails, satisfied in his revenge, concluded the old man as he accompanied the youth out of the cave into the open air. End of chapter 45
Chapter 46 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 46. The Cockpit. To keep holy the afternoon of the Sabbath, one generally goes to the cockpit in the Philippines, just as to the bullfights in Spain. Cockfighting, a passion introduced into the country and exploited for a century past, is one of the vices of the people, more widely spread than opium smoking among the Chinese. There the poor man goes to risk all that he has, desirous of getting rich without work. There the rich man goes to amuse himself, using the money that remains to him from his feasts and his masses of thanksgiving. The fortune that he gambles is his own, the cock is raised with much more care perhaps than his son and successor in the cockpit, so we have nothing to say against it. Since the government permits it, and even in a way recommends it, by providing that the spectacle may take place only in the public plazas on holidays, in order that all may see it and be encouraged by the example, from the high mass until nightfall, eight hours, let us proceed thither to seek out some of our acquaintances. The cockpit of San Diego does not differ from those to be found in other towns, except in some details. It consists of three parts, the first of which, the entrance, is a large rectangle some twenty meters long by fourteen wide. On one side is the gateway, generally tended by an old woman whose business it is to collect the sapintu, or admission fee. Of this contribution, which everyone pays, the government receives a part, amounting to some hundreds of thousands of pesos a year. It is said that with this money, with which vice pays its license, magnificent schoolhouses are erected, bridges and roads are constructed, prizes for encouraging agriculture and commerce are distributed. Blessed be the vice that produces such good results. In this first enclosure are the vendors of bouillons, cigars, sweetmeats and foodstuffs. There swarm the boys in company with their fathers or uncles, who carefully initiate them into the secrets of life. This enclosure communicates with another of somewhat larger dimensions, a kind of foyer where the public gathers while waiting for the combats. There are the greater part of the fighting cocks, tied with cords which are fastened to the ground by means of a piece of bone or hard wood. There are assembled the gamblers, the devotees, those skilled in tying on the gaffs. There they make agreements, they deliberate, they beg for loans, they curse, they swear, they laugh boisterously. That one fondles his chicken, rubbing his hand over its brilliant plumage, this one examines and counts the scales on its legs. They recount the exploits of the champions. There you will see many with mournful faces carrying by the feet corpses picked of their feathers, the creature that was the favorite for months, petted and cared for day and night, on which were founded such flattering hopes, is now nothing more than a carcass to be sold for a peseta or to be stewed with ginger and eaten that very night. Sic transit gloria mundi. The loser returns to the home where his anxious wife and ragged children await him, without his money or his chicken. Of all that golden dream, of all those vigils during months from the dawn of day to the setting of the sun, of all those fatigues and labors, there results only a peseta, the ashes left from so much smoke. In this foyer even the least intelligent takes part in the discussion, while the man of most hasty judgment conscientiously investigates the matter, weighs, examines, extends the wings, feels the muscles of the cocks. Some go very well dressed, surrounded and followed by the partisans of their champions. Others, who are dirty and bear the imprint of vice on their squalid features, anxiously follow the movements of the rich to note the bets, since the purse may become empty, but the passion never satiated. No countenance here but is animated. 
not here is to be found the indolent apathetic silent filipino all is movement passion eagerness it may be one would say that they have that thirst which is quickened by the water of the swamp from this place one passes into the arena which is known as the rueda the wheel the ground here surrounded by bamboo stakes is usually higher than that in the two other divisions in the back part reaching almost to the roof are tires of seats for the spectators or gamblers since these are the same during the fights these seats are filled with men and boys who shout clamor sweat quarrel and blaspheme fortunately hardly any women get in this far in the rueda are the men of importance the rich the famous betters the contractor the referee on the perfectly levelled ground the cocks fight and from there destiny apportions to the families smiles or tears feast or famine at the time of entering we see the gobernadorcillo capitan pablo capitan basilio and lucas the man with the scar on his face who felt so deeply the death of his brother capitan basilio approaches one of the townsmen and asks do you know which cock Capitan Tiago is going to bring? I don't know, sir. This morning two came, one of them the Lasak that whipped the consul's Talisain. Do you think that my bulik is a match for it? I should say so. I'll bet my house and my camisa on it. At that moment Capitan Tiago arrives, dressed like the heavy gamblers, in a camisa of canton linen, woolen pantaloons and a wide straw hat. Behind him come two servants carrying the lasak and a white cock of enormous size. Sinang tells me that Maria is improving all the time, says Capitan Basilio. She has no more fever, but is still very weak. Did you lose last night? A little. I hear that you won. I'm going to see if I can't get even here. Do you want to fight the Lazak? asks Capitan Basilio, looking at the cock and taking it from the servant. That depends. If there is a bet. How much will you put up? I won't gamble for less than two. Have you seen my bulik? inquires Capitan Basilio, calling to a man who is carrying a small gamecock. Capitan Tiago examines it, and after feeling its weight and studying its scales, returns it with the question, How much will you put up? Whatever you will. Two and five hundred. Three? Three. For the next fight after this. The chorus of curious bystanders and the gamblers spread the news that two celebrated cocks will fight, each of which has a history and a well-earned reputation. All wish to see and examine the two celebrities. Opinions are offered. Prophecies are made. Meanwhile, the murmur of the voices grows. The confusion increases. The rueda is broken into. The seats are filled. The skilled attendants carry the two cocks into the arena, a white and a red, already armed but with the gaffs still sheathed cries are heard on the white on the white while some other voice answered on the red the odds are on the white he is the favorite the red is the outsider the dejado members of the civil guard move about in the crowd they are not dressed in the uniform of that meritorious corps but neither are they in civilian costume Trousers of gingon with a red stripe, a camisa stained blue from the faded blouse, and a service cap make up their costume, in keeping with their deportment. They make bets and keep watch, they raise disturbances and talk of keeping the peace. While the spectators are yelling, waving their hands, flourishing and clinking pieces of silver, while they search in their pockets for the last coin, or, in the lack of such, try to pledge their word, promising to sell the carabao or the next crop, two boys, brothers apparently, follow the betters with wistful eyes, loiter about, 
murmur timid words to which no one listens, become more and more gloomy, and gaze at one another ill-humouredly and dejectedly. Lucas watches them covertly, smiles malignantly, jingles his silver, passes close to them, and gazing into the rueda cries out, Fifty! Fifty to twenty on the white! The two brothers exchange glances. I told you, muttered the elder, that you shouldn't have put up all the money. If you had listened to me, we should now have something to bet on the red. The younger timidly approached Lucas and touched him on the arm. Oh, it's you, exclaimed the latter, turning around with faint surprise. Does your brother accept my proposition, or do you want to bet? How can we bet when we've lost everything? Then you accept? He doesn't want to. If you would lend us something, now that you say you know us... Lucas scratched his head, pulled at his camisa, and replied, Yes, I know you. You are Tarsilo and Bruno, both young and strong. I know that your father died as a result of the hundred lashes a day those soldiers gave him. I know that you don't think of revenging him. Don't meddle in our affairs, broke in Tarsilo, the elder. That might lead to trouble. If it were not that we have a sister, we should have been hanged long ago. Hanged? Oh, they only hang a coward, one who has no money or influence. And at all events, the mountains are near. A hundred to twenty on the white, cried a passer-by. Lend us four pesos. Three, two, begged the younger. We'll soon pay them back double. The fight is going to commence. Lucas again scratched his head. Tush! The money isn't mine. Don Crisostomo has given it to me for those who are willing to serve him. But I see that you're not like your father. He was really brave. Let him who is not so seek amusement. So saying, he drew away from them a little. Let's take him up. What's the difference? said Bruno. It's the same to be shot as to be hanged. We poor folks are good for nothing else. You're right, but think of our sister. Meanwhile, the ring has been cleared and the combat is about to begin. The voices die away as the two starters, with the expert who fastens the gaffs, are left alone in the centre. At a signal from the referee, the expert unsheaths the gaffs and the fine blades glitter threateningly. Sadly and silently, the two brothers draw nearer to the ring until their foreheads are pressed against the railing. A man approaches them and calls into their ears, Pare, a hundred to ten on the white. Tarsilo stares at him in a foolish way and responds to Bruno's nudge with a grunt. The starters hold the cocks with skilful delicacy, taking care not to wound themselves. A solemn silence reigns. The spectators seem to be changed into hideous wax figures. They present one cock to the other, holding his head down so that the other may peck at it and thus irritate him. Then the other is given a like opportunity, for in every duel there must be fair play, whether it is a question of Parisian cocks or Filipino cocks. Afterward, they hold them up in sight of each other, close together, so that each of the enraged little creatures may see who it is that has pulled out a feather and with whom he must fight. Their neck feathers bristle up as they gaze at each other fixedly, with flashes of anger darting from their little round eyes. Now the moment has come, the attendants place them on the ground a short distance apart and leave them a clear field. Slowly they advance, their footfalls are audible on the hard ground. No one in the crowd speaks, no one breathes. Raising and lowering their head as if to gorge one another with a look, the two cocks utter sounds of defiance and contempt. Each sees the bright blade throwing out its cold, bluish reflections. The danger animates them, and they rush directly toward each other, but a pace apart they check themselves with fixed gaze and bristling plumage. At that moment their little heads are filled with a rush of blood, their anger flashes forth, and they hurl themselves together with instinctive valour. They strike beak to beak, breast to breast, gaff to gaff, wing to wing, but the blows are skilfully parried, 
only a few feathers fall. Again they size each other up. Suddenly the white rises on his wings, brandishing the deadly knife, but the red has bent his legs and lowered his head, so the white smites only the empty air. Then, on touching the ground, the white, fearing a blow from behind, turns quickly to face his adversary. The red attacks him furiously, but he defends himself calmly, not undeservedly is he the favourite of the spectators, all of whom tremulously and anxiously follow the fortunes of the fight, only here and there an involuntary cry being heard. The ground becomes strewn with red and white feathers dyed in blood, but the contest is not for the first blood. The Filipino, carrying out the laws dictated by his government, wishes it to be to the death, or until one or the other turns tail and runs. Blood covers the ground, the blows are more numerous, but victory still hangs in the balance. At last, with a supreme effort, the white throws himself forward for a final stroke, fastens his gaff in the wing of the red, and catches it between the bones. But the white himself has been wounded in the breast, and both are weak and feeble from loss of blood. Breathless, their strength spent, caught one against the other, they remain motionless until the white, with blood pouring from his beak, falls, kicking his death throes. The red remains at his side with his wing caught, then slowly doubles up his legs and gently closes his eyes. Then the referee, in accordance with the rule prescribed by the government, declares the red the winner. A savage yell greets the decision, a yell that is heard over the whole town, even and prolonged. He who hears this from afar then knows that the winner is the one against which the odds were placed, or the joy would not be so lasting. The same happens with the nations. When a small one gains a victory over a large one, it is sung and recounted from age to age. You see now? said Bruno dejectedly to his brother. If you had listened to me, we should now have a hundred pesos. You are the cause of our being penniless. Tarsilo did not answer, but gazed about him as if looking for someone. There he is, talking to Pedro, added Bruno. He's giving him money, lots of money. True it was that Lucas was counting silver coins into the hand of Caesar's husband, the two then exchanged some words in secret and separated, apparently satisfied. Pedro must have agreed. That's what it is to be decided, sighed Bruno. Tarsilo remained gloomy and thoughtful, wiping away with the cuff of his camisa the perspiration that ran down his forehead. Brother, said Bruno, I'm going to accept if you don't decide. The law continues. The Lassac must win, and we ought not to lose any chance. I want to bet on the next fight. What's the difference? We'll revenge our father. Wait, said Tarsilo, as he gazed at him fixedly, eye to eye, while both turned pale. I'll go with you. You're right. We'll revenge our father. Still he hesitated, and again wiped away the perspiration. What's stopping you? asked Bruno impatiently. Do you know what fight comes next? Is it worthwhile? If you think that way, no. Haven't you heard? The bulik of Capitan Basilio against Capitan Tiago's Lassac. According to the law, the Lassac must win. Ah, the Lassac. I'd bet on it too. But let's be sure first. Bruno made a sign of impatience, but followed his brother, who examined the cock, studied it, meditated and reflected, asked some questions. The poor fellow was in doubt. Bruno gazed at him with nervous anger. But don't you see that wide scale he has by the side of his spur? Don't you see those feet? What more do you want? Look at those legs, spread out his wings. And this split scale above this wide one? And this double one? Tarsilo did not hear him, but went on examining the cock. The clinking of gold and silver came to his ears. "'Now let's look at the bulik, he said in a thick voice. Bruno stamped on the ground and gnashed his teeth, but obeyed. 
they approached another group where the cock was being prepared for the ring. A gaff was selected, red silk thread for tying it on was waxed and rubbed thoroughly. Tarsilo took in the creature with a gloomily impressive gaze, as if he were not looking at the bird so much as at something in the future. He rubbed his hand across his forehead and said to his brother in a stifled voice, "'Are you ready?' "'I? Long ago. Without looking at them. But, oh, poor sister! Abba! Haven't they told you that Don Crisostoma is the leader? Didn't you see him walking with the captain-general? What risk do we run? And if we get killed? What's the difference? Our father was flogged to death. You're right. The brothers now sought for Lucas in the different groups. As soon as they saw him, Tarsilo stopped. No, let's get out of here. We're going to ruin ourselves, he exclaimed. Go on if you want to. I'm going to accept. Bruno! Unfortunately, a man approached them, saying, Are you betting? I'm for the bulik. The brothers did not answer. I'll give odds. How much? asked Bruno. The man began to count out his pesos. Bruno watched him breathlessly. I have two hundred. Fifty to forty. No, said Bruno resolutely. Put... All right, fifty to thirty. Double it if you want to. All right. The bulik belongs to my protector, and I've just won. A hundred to sixty. Taken. Wait till I get the money. But I'll hold the stakes, said the other, not confiding much in Bruno's looks. It's all the same to me, answered the letter, trusting to his fists. Then turning to his brother, he added, Even if you do keep out, I'm going in. Tarsilo reflected, he loved his brother and liked the sport, and unable to desert him, he murmured, Let it go. They made their way to Lucas, who, on seeing them approach, smiled. Sir, called Tarsilo, what's up? How much will you give us? asked the two brothers together. I've already told you. If you will undertake to get others for the purpose of making a surprise attack in the barracks, I'll give each of you thirty pesos and ten pesos for each companion you bring. If all goes well, each one will receive a hundred pesos and you double that amount. Don Crisostomo is rich. Accept it, exclaimed Bruno. Let's have the money. I knew you were brave as your father was. Come so that those fellows who killed him may not overhear us, said Lucas, indicating the civil guards. Taking them into a corner, he explained to them while he was counting out the money. Tomorrow Don Crisostomo will get back with the arms. Day after tomorrow, about eight o'clock at night, go to the cemetery, and I'll let you know the final arrangements. You have time to look for companions. After they had left him, the two brothers seemed to have changed parts. Tarsilo was calm, while Bruno was uneasy. End of chapter 46「Chapter 47 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Derbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 47 The Two Señoras While Capitán Tiago was gambling on his lasak, Doña Victorina was taking a walk through the town for the purpose of observing how the indolent Indians kept their houses and fields. She was dressed as elegantly as possible with all her ribbons and flowers over her silk gown in order to impress the provincials and make them realize what a distance intervened between them and her sacred person. Giving her arm to her lame husband, she strutted along the streets amid the wonder and stupefaction of the natives. Her cousin Linares had remained in the house. "'What ugly shacks these Indians have!' she began with a grimace. "'I don't see how they can live in them. 
one must have to be an indian and how rude they are and how proud they don't take off their hats when they meet us hit them over the head as the curates and the officers of the civil guard do teach them politeness and if they hit me back asked dr de esparagna that's what you're a man for but but, but I, i'm lame Doña Victorina was falling into a bad humor. The streets were unpaved, and the train of her gown was covered with dust. Besides, they had met a number of young women who, in passing them, had dropped their eyes and had not admired her rich costume as they should have done. Sinang's cochero, who was driving Sinang and her cousin in an elegant carriage, had the impudence to yell, Tabi! in such a commanding tone that she had to jump out of the way and could only protest look at that brute of a cochero i'm going to call his master to train his servants better let's go back to the house she commanded to her husband who fearing a storm wheeled on his crutch in obedience to her mandate they met and exchanged greetings with the alferez this increased Doña Victorina's ill-humor, for the officer not only did not proffer any compliment on her costume, but even seemed to stare at it in a mocking way. "'You ought not to shake hands with a mere alferez,' she said to her husband as the soldier left them. "'He scarcely touched his helmet while you took off your hat. You don't know how to maintain your rank.' "'He's the b boss here.' What do we care for that? We're Indians, perhaps? You're right, he assented, not caring to quarrel. They passed in front of the officer's dwelling. Doña Consolación was at the window, as usual, dressed in flannel and smoking her cigar. As the house was low, the two señoras measured one another with looks. Doña Victorina stared, while the muse of the civil guard examined her from head to foot, and then, sticking out her lower lip, turned her head away and spat on the ground. This used up the last of Doña Victorina's patience. Leaving her husband without support, she planted herself in front of the alfereza, trembling with anger from head to foot and unable to speak. Doña Consolación slowly turned her head, calmly looked her over again, and once more spat, this time with greater disdain. "'What's the matter with you, Doña?' she asked. "'Can you tell me, Señora, why you look at me so? Are you envious?' Doña Victorina was at length able to articulate. "'I? Envious of you? I? Of you?' drawled the muse. Yes, I envy you those frizzes. Come, woman, pleaded the doctor. D don't take any n notice. Let me teach this shameless slattern a lesson, replied his wife, giving him such a shove that he nearly kissed the ground. Then she again turned to Doña Consolación. Remember who you're dealing with, she exclaimed. Don't think that I'm a provincial or a soldier's querida. In my house in Manila the alfereses don't enter. They wait at the door. Ha <laughs> ha! Excelentissima senora! Alfereses don't enter, eh? Huh? But cripples do, like that one. <laughs> Had it not been for the rouge, Doña Victorina would have been seen to blush. She tried to get to her antagonist, but the sentinel stopped her. In the meantime, the street was filling up with a curious crowd. "'Listen, I lower myself talking to you. People of quality. Don't you want to wash my clothes? I'll pay you well. Do you think that I don't know that you were a washerwoman?' Doña Consolación straightened up furiously. The remark about washing hurt her. "'Do you think that we don't know who you are and what class of people you belong with?' Get out, my husband has already told me. Senora, I at least have never belonged to more than one, but you? One must be dying of hunger to take the leavings, the mop of the whole world. 
this shot found its mark with Doña Victorina. She rolled up her sleeves, clenched her fists, and gritted her teeth. Come down, old sow, she cried. I'm going to smash that dirty mouth of yours. Get it out of a battalion, filthy hag. The muse immediately disappeared from the window and was soon seen running down the stairs, flourishing her husband's whip. Don Tiburcio interposed himself supplicatingly, but they would have come to blows had not the alferez arrived on the scene. Ladies, Don Tiburcio, train your woman better, buy her some decent clothes, and if you haven't any money left, drop the people. That's what you've got soldiers for, yelled Doña Victorina. Here I am, senora. Why doesn't your excellency smash my mouth? You're only tongue and spittle, Doña Excelencia. Senora, cried the alferez furiously to Doña Victorina, be thankful that I remember that you're a woman, or else I'd kick you to pieces, frizzes, ribbons, and all. Senor alferez, get out, you quack. You don't wear the pants. The women brought into play words and gestures, insults and abuse, dragging out all the evil that was stored in the recesses of their minds. Since all four talked at once and said so many things that might hurt the prestige of certain classes by the truths that were brought to light, we forbear from recording what they said. The curious spectators, while they may not have understood all that was said, got not a little entertainment out of the scene, and hoped that the affair would come to blows. Unfortunately for them, the curate came along and restored order. Senores, senoras, what a shame! Senor Alferez! What are you doing here, you hypocrite, carlist? Don Tiburcio, take your wife away. Senora, hold your tongue. Say that to these robbers of the poor! Little by little the lexicon of epithets was exhausted, the review of shamelessness of the two couples completed, and with threats and insults they gradually drew away from one another. Fray Salvi moved from one group to the other, giving animation to the scene. Would that our friend the correspondent had been present! "'This very day we'll go to Manila and see the Captain-General,' declared the raging Doña Victorina to her husband. You're not a man. It's a waste of money to buy trousers for you. B but, woman, the g guards? I'm lame. You must challenge him for pistol or sword or... or... Doña Victorina stared fixedly at his false teeth. My dear, I've never had hold of a but she did not let him finish. With a majestic sweep of her hand, she snatched out his false teeth and trampled them in the street. Thus, he half crying and she breathing fire, they reached the house. Linares was talking with Maria Clara, Sinang, and Victoria, and as he had heard nothing of the quarrel, became rather uneasy at sight of his cousins. Maria Clara, lying in an easy chair among pillows and wraps, was greatly surprised to see the new physiognomy of her doctor. Cousin, began Doña Victorina, you must challenge the alferez right away, or... Why? asked the startled Linares. You challenge him right now, or else I'll tell everybody here who you are. But, Doña Victorina... The three girls exchanged glances. You'll see. The alferez has insulted us and said that you are what you are. His old hag came down with a whip, and he, this thing here, permitted the insult. A man! Abba! exclaimed Sinan. There had a fight, and we didn't see it. The alferez smashed the doctor's teeth, observed Victoria. This very day we go to Manila. You, you stay here to challenge him, or else I'll tell Don Santiago that all we're told him is a lie. I'll tell him. But Doña Victorina, Doña Victorina, interrupted the now pallid Linares, going up to her. Be calm, don't call up. Then he added in a whisper, don't be imprudent, especially not now. 
At that moment Capitan Tiago came in from the cockpit, sad and sighing. He had lost his lasak. But Doña Victorina left him no time to grieve. In a few words, but with no lack of strong language, she related what had happened, trying, of course, to put herself in the best light possible. "'Linares is going to challenge him, do you hear? "'If he doesn't, don't let him marry your daughter. "'Don't you permit it. "'If he hasn't any courage, he doesn't deserve Clarita.' "'So you're going to marry this gentleman?' "'asked Sinang, but her merry eyes filled with tears. "'I knew that you were prudent, but not that you were fickle.' "'Pale as wax, Maria Clara partly rose "'and stared with frightened eyes at her father, "'at Doña Victorina, at Linares. "'The latter blushed. "'Capitan Tiago dropped his eyes, while the senora went on. "'Clarita, bear this in mind. "'Never marry a man that doesn't wear trousers.' You expose yourself to insults even from the dogs. The girl did not answer her, but turned to her friends and said, Help me to my room. I can't walk alone. By their aid she rose, and with her waist encircled by the round arms of her friends, resting her marble-like head on the shoulder of the beautiful Victoria, she went to her chamber. That same night the married couple gathered their effects together and presented Capitan Tiago with a bill which amounted to several thousand pesos. Very early the following day they left for Manila in his carriage, committing to the bashful Linares the office of avenger. End of chapter 47「as Lucas had foretold, Ibarra arrived on the following day. His first visit was to the family of Capitan Tiago for the purpose of seeing Maria Clara and informing her that his grace had reconciled him with religion and that he brought to the curate a letter of recommendation in the handwriting of the archbishop himself. Aunt Isabel was not a little rejoiced at this, for she liked the young man and did not look favourably on the marriage of her niece with Linares. Capitan Tiago was not at home. "'Come in,' said the aunt in her broken Spanish. "'Maria, Don Crisostomo is once more in the favour of God. The archbishop has discommunicated him.' But the youth was unable to advance. The smile froze on his lips. Words failed him. Standing on the balcony at the side of Maria Clara was Linares, arranging bouquets of flowers and leaves. Roses and sampaguitas were scattered about on the floor. Reclining in a big chair, pale, with a sad and pensive air, Maria Clara toyed with an ivory fan which was not whiter than her shapely fingers. At the appearance of Ibarra, Linares turned pale and Maria Clara's cheeks flushed crimson. She tried to rise, but strength failed her, so she dropped her eyes and let the fan fall. An embarrassed silence prevailed for a few moments. Ibarra was then able to move forward and murmur tremblingly, I've just got back and have come immediately to see you. I find you better than I had thought I should. The girl seemed to have been stricken dumb. She neither said anything nor raised her eyes. Ibarra looked Linares over from head to foot with a stare which the bashful youth bore haughtily. "'Well, I see that my arrival was unexpected,' said Ibarra slowly. "'Maria, pardon me that I didn't have myself announced. "'At some other time I'll be able to make explanations to you about my conduct. "'We'll still see one another, surely?' "'These last words were accompanied by a look at Linares. 
the girl raised toward him her lovely eyes, full of purity and sadness. They were so beseeching and eloquent that Ibarra stopped in confusion. "'May I come tomorrow?' "'You know that for my part you're always welcome,' she answered faintly. Ibarra withdrew in apparent calm, but with a tempest in his head and ice in his heart. What he had just seen and felt was incomprehensible to him. Was it doubt, dislike, or faithlessness? "'Oh, only a woman, after all,' he murmured. Taking no note of where he was going, he reached a spot where the schoolhouse was under construction. The work was well advanced, nor Juan with his mile and plump bob coming and going among the numerous labourers. Upon catching sight of Ibarra, he ran to meet him. Don Crisostomo, at last you've come. We've all been waiting for you. Look at the walls, they're already more than a metre high, and within two days they'll be up to the height of a man. I've put in only the strongest and most durable woods. Molave, Dungon, Ipil, Langil, and sent for the finest, Tindalo, Malatapai, Pino, and Nara for the finishings. Do you want to look at the foundations? The workmen saluted Ibarra respectfully, while Nor Juan made voluble explanations. Here is the piping that I have taken the liberty to add, he said. These subterranean conduits lead to a sort of cesspool thirty yards away. It will help fertilize the garden. There was nothing of that in the plan. Does it displease you? Quite the contrary. I approve what you've done and congratulate you. You are a real architect. From whom did you learn the business? From myself, sir, replied the old man modestly. Oh, before I forget about it, tell those who may have scruples, if perhaps there is any one who fears to speak to me, that I am no longer excommunicated. The archbishop invited me to dinner. Ah, bah, sir, we don't pay any attention to excommunications. All of us are excommunicated. Padre Damaso himself is, and yet he stays fat. How's that? It's true, sir, for a year ago he caned the coadjutor, who is just as much a sacred person as he is. Who pays any attention to excommunications, sir? Among the labourers Ibarra caught sight of Elias, who, as he saluted him along with the others, gave him to understand by a look that he had something to say to him. "'Nor Juan,' said Ibarra, "'will you bring me your list of the labourers?' Nor Juan disappeared, and Ibarra approached Elias, who was by himself, lifting a heavy stone into a cart. "'If you can grant me a few hours' conversation, sir, walk down to the shore of the lake this evening and get into my banca. The youth nodded, and Elias moved away. Nor Juan now brought the list, but Ibarra scanned it in vain. The name of Elias did not appear on it. End of chapter 48Chapter 49 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 49. The Voice of the Hunted. As the sun was sinking below the horizon, Ibarra stepped into Elias's banca at the shore of the lake. The youth looked out of humor. "'Pardon me, sir,' said Elias sadly on seeing him, "'that I have been so bold as to make this appointment. I wanted to talk to you freely, and so I chose this means, for here we won't have any listeners. We can return within an hour.' "'You're wrong, friend,' answered Ibarra with a forced smile. You'll have to take me to that town whose belfry we see from here. A mischance forces me to this. A mischance? Yes. On my way here I met the Alferes, and he forced his company on me. I thought of you and remembered that he knows you, so to get away from him I told him that I was going to that town. 
I'll have to stay there all day since he will look for me tomorrow afternoon. I appreciate your thoughtfulness, but you might simply have invited him to accompany you, answered Elias naturally. What about you? He wouldn't have recognized me, since the only time he ever saw me he wasn't in a position to take careful note of my appearance. I'm in bad luck, sighed Ibarra, thinking of Maria Clara. What did you have to tell me? Elias looked about him. They were already at a distance from the shore, the sun had set, and as in these latitudes there is scarcely any twilight, the shades were lengthening, bringing into view the bright disk of the full moon. Sir, replied Elias gravely, I am the bearer of the wishes of many unfortunates. Unfortunates? What do you mean? In a few words Elias recounted his conversation with the leader of the Tulisanes, omitting the latter's doubts and threats. Ibarra listened attentively and was the first to break the long silence that reigned after he had finished his story. So they want... Radical reforms in the armed forces, in the priesthood, and in the administration of justice. That is to say, they ask for paternal treatment from the government. Reforms? In what sense? For example, more respect for a man's dignity, more security for the individual, less force in the armed forces, fewer privileges for that corpse which so easily abuses what it has. Elias, answered the youth, I don't know who you are, but I suspect that you are not a man of the people. You think and act so differently from others. You will understand me if I tell you that, however imperfect the condition of affairs may be now, it would be more so if it were changed. I might be able to get the friends that I have in Madrid to talk by paying them. I might even be able to see the Captain General, but neither would the former accomplish anything, nor has the latter sufficient power to introduce so many novelties. Nor would I ever take a single step in that direction, for the reason that, while I fully understand that it is true that these corporations have their faults, they are necessary at this time. They are what is known as a necessary evil. Greatly surprised, Elias raised his head and looked at him in astonishment. Do you, then, also believe in a necessary evil, sir? He asked in a voice that trembled slightly. Do you believe that in order to do good it is necessary to do evil? No, I believe in it as in a violent remedy that we make use of when we wish to cure a disease. Now then, the country is an organism suffering from a chronic malady, and in order to cure it, the government sees the necessity of employing such means, harsh and violent if you wish, but useful and necessary. He is a bad doctor, sir, who seeks only to destroy or stifle the symptoms without an effort to examine into the origin of the malady, or, when knowing it, fears to attack it. The civil guard has only this purpose, the repression of crime by means of terror and force, a purpose that it does not fulfill, or accomplishes only incidentally. You must take into account the truth that society can be severe with individuals only when it has provided them with the means necessary for their moral perfection. In our country where there is no society, since there is no unity between the people and the government, the latter should be indulgent, not only because indulgence is necessary, but also because the individual, abandoned and uncared for by it, has less responsibility, for the very reason that he has received less guidance. Besides, following out your comparison, the treatment that is applied to the ills of the country is so destructive that it is felt only in the sound parts of the organism, whose vitality is thus weakened and made receptive of evil. Would it not be more rational to strengthen the diseased parts of the organism and lessen the violence of the remedy a little? To weaken the civil guard would be to endanger the security of the towns. The security of the towns, exclaimed Elias bitterly. It will soon be fifteen years since the towns have had their civil guard, and look, still we have tulisanes, still we hear that they sack towns, that they infest the highways. Robberies continue and the perpetrators are not hunted down, crime flourishes and the real criminal goes scot-free, but not so the peaceful inhabitant of the town. Ask any honourable citizen if he looks upon this institution as a benefit, a protection on the part of the government, and not as an imposition, a despotism whose outrageous acts do more damage than the violent deeds of criminals. 
These latter are indeed serious, but they are rare, and against them one has the right to defend himself. But against the molestations of legal force he is not even allowed a protest, and if they are not serious, they are nevertheless continued and sanctioned. What effect does this institution produce among our people? It paralyzes communication because all are afraid of being abused on trifling pretexts. It pays more attention to formalities than to the real nature of things, which is the first symptom of incapacity. Because one has forgotten his cedula, he must be manacled and knocked about, regardless of the fact that he may be a decent and respectable citizen. The superiors hold it their first duty to make people salute them, either willingly or forcibly, even in the darkness of the night, and their inferiors imitate them by mistreating and robbing the country folk, nor are pretexts lacking to this end. Sanctity of the home does not exist. Not long ago in Kalamba they entered, by forcing their way through the windows, the house of a peaceful inhabitant to whom their chief owed money and favours. There is no personal security. When they need to have their barracks or houses cleaned, they go out and arrest anyone who does not resist them in order to make him work the whole day. Do you care to hear more? During these holidays, gambling, which is prohibited by law, has gone on, while they forcibly broke up the celebrations permitted by the authorities. You saw what the people thought about these things. What have they got by repressing their anger and hoping for human justice? Ah, oh, sir, if that is what you call keeping the peace. I agree with you that there are evils, replied Ibarra, but let us bear with those evil on account of the benefits that accompany them. This institution may be imperfect, but, believe me, by the fear that it inspires, it keeps the number of criminals from increasing. Say rather that by this fear the number is increased, corrected Elias. Before the creation of this corpse, almost all the evildoers, with the exception of a very few, were criminals from hunger. They plundered and robbed in order to live, but when their time of want was past, they again left the highways clear. Sufficient to put them to flight were the poor but brave quadrilleros, they who have been so calumniated by the writers about our country, who have for a right death, for duty fighting, and for reward jests. Now are the tulisanes who are such for life. A single fault, a crime inhumanely punished, resistance against the outrages of this power, fear of atrocious tortures, cast them out forever from society and condemn them to slay or be slain. The terrorism of the civil guard closes against them the doors of repentance, and as outlaws they fight to defend themselves in the mountains better than the soldiers at whom they laugh. The result is that we are unable to put an end to the evil that we have created. Remember what the prudence of the captain-general de la Torre accomplished. The amnesty granted by him to those unhappy people has proved that in those mountains there still beat the hearts of men and that they only wait for pardon. Terrorism is useful when the people are slaves, when the mountains afford no hiding places, when power places a sentinel behind every tree, and when the body of the slave contains nothing more than a stomach and intestines. But when in desperation he fights for his life, feeling his arms strong, his heart throb, his whole being filled with hate, how can terrorism hope to extinguish the flame to which it is only adding fuel? I am perplexed, Elias, to hear you talk thus, and I should almost believe that you were right, had I not my own convictions. But note this fact, and don't be offended, for I consider you an exception. Look who the men are that ask for these reforms. Nearly all criminals are on the way to be such. Criminals now, or future criminals, but why are they such? because their peace has been disturbed, their happiness destroyed, their dearest affections wounded, and when they have asked justice for protection, they have become convinced that they can expect it only from themselves. But you are mistaken, sir, if you think that only the criminals ask for justice. Go from town to town, from house to house, listen to the secret sighings in the bosoms of the families, and you will be convinced that the evils which the civil guard corrects are the same as if not less than, those it causes all the time. Should we decide from this that all the people are criminals? If so, then why defend some from the others? Why not destroy them all? Some error exists here which I do not see just now, some fallacy in the theory to invalidate the practice, 
for in spain the mother country this corps is displaying and has ever displayed great usefulness i don't doubt it perhaps there it is better organized the men of better grade perhaps also spain needs it while the philippines does not our customs our mode of life which are always invoked when there is a desire to deny us some right are entirely overlooked when the desire is to impose something upon us and tell me sir why have not the other nations which from their nearness to spain must be more like her than the philippines is adopted this institution is it because of this that they still have fewer robberies on their railway trains fewer riots fewer murders and fewer assassinations in their great capitals ibarra bowed his head in deep thought raising it after a few moments to reply this question my friend calls for serious study if my inquiries convince me that these complaints are well founded i will write to my friends in madrid since we have no representatives meanwhile believe me that the government needs a corps with strength enough to make itself respected and to enforce its authority yes sir when the government is at war with the country but for the welfare of the government itself we must not have the people think that they are in opposition to authority rather if such were true if we prefer force to prestige we ought to take care of whom we grant this unlimited power this authority so much power in the hands of men ignorant men filled with passions without moral training of untried principles is a weapon in the hands of a madman in a defenceless multitude i concede and wish to believe with you that the government needs this weapon but then let it choose this weapon carefully let it select the most worthy instruments and since it prefers to take upon itself authority rather than have the people granted at least let it be seen that it knows how to exercise it elias spoke passionately enthusiastically in vibrating tones his eyes flashed a solemn pause followed the banker unimpelled by the pedal seemed to stand still on the water the moon shone majestically in a sapphire sky and a few lights glimmered on the distant shore what more do they ask for inquired ibarra reform in the priesthood answered elias in a sad and discouraged tone these unfortunate ask for more protection against against the religious orders against their oppressors sir has the philippines forgotten what she owes to those orders has she forgotten the immense debt of gratitude that is due from her to those who snatched her from error to give her the true faith to those who have protested her against the tyrannical acts of the civil power this is the evil result of not knowing the history of our native land the surprised elias could hardly credit what he heard sir he replied in a grave tone you accuse these people of ingratitude let me one of the people who suffer defend them favors rendered in order to have any claims to recognition must be disinterested let us pass over its missionary work the much invoked christian charity let us brush history aside and not ask what spain has done with the jewish people who gave all europe a book a religion and a god what she has done with the arabic people who gave her culture who were tolerant with her religious beliefs and who awoke her lethargic national spirit so nearly destroyed during the roman and gothic dominations you say that she snatched us from error and gave us the true faith do you call faith these outward forms do you call religion this traffic in girdles and scapularies truth these miracles and wonderful tales that we hear daily is this the law of jesus christ for this it was hardly necessary that a god should allow himself to be crucified or that we should be obliged to show eternal gratitude superstition existed long before it was only necessary to systematize it and raise the price of its merchandise you will tell me that however imperfect our religion may be at present it is preferable to what we had before well, i believe that too and would agree with you in saying so but the cost is too great since for it we have given up our nationality our independence for it we have given over to its priests our best towns our fields and still give up our savings by the purchase of religious objects an article of foreign manufacture has been introduced among us we have paid well for it and we are even 
if you mean the protection that they afforded us against the encomenderos i might answer that through them we fell under the power of the encomenderos but no i realized that a true faith and a sincere love for humanity guided the first missionaries to our shores i realized the debt of gratitude we owe to those noble hearts i know that at that time spain abounded in heroes of all kinds in religious as well as in political affairs in civil and in military life but because the forefathers were virtuous should we consent to the abuses of their degenerate descendants because they have rendered us great service should we be to blame for preventing them from doing us wrong the country does not ask for their expulsion but only for reforms required by the changed circumstances and new needs i love our native land as well as you can elias i understand something of what it desires and i have listened with attention to all you have said but after all my friend i believe that we are looking at things through rather impassioned eyes here less than in other parts do i see the necessity for reforms is it possible sir asked elias extending his arms in a gesture of despair that you do not see the necessity for reforms you after the misfortunes of your family ah i forget myself and my own troubles in the presence of the security of the philippines in the presence of the interests of spain interrupted ibarra warmly to preserve the philippines it is meet that the friars continues as they are on the union with spain depends the welfare of our country when ibarra had ceased elias still sat in an attitude of attention with a sad countenance and eyes that had lost their lustre the missionaries conquered the country it is true he replied but do you believe that by the friars the philippines will be preserved yes by them alone such is the belief of all who have written about the country oh exclaimed elias dejectedly throwing the paddle down in the banca i did not believe that you would have so poor an idea of the government and of the country why don't you condemn both what would he say of the members of a family that dwells in peace only through the intervention of an outsider a country that is obedient because it is deceived a government that commands b because it avails itself of fraud a government that does not know how to make itself loved or respected for its own sake pardon me sir but i believe that our government is stupid and is working its own ruin when it rejoices that such is the belief i thank you for your kindness where do you wish me to take you now no replied ibarra let us talk it is necessary to see who is right on such an important subject pardon me sir replied elias shaking his head but i haven't the eloquence to convince you even though i have had some education i am still an indian my way of life seems to you a precarious one and my words will always seem to you suspicious those who have given voice to the opposite opinion are spaniards and as such even though they may speak idly and foolishly their tones their titles and their origin make their words sacred and give them such authority that i have desisted forever from arguing against them moreover when i see that you who love your country you whose father sleeps beneath these quiet waters you who have seen yourself attacked insulted and persecuted hold such opinions in spite of all these things and in spite of your knowledge i begin to doubt my own convictions and to admit the possibility that the people may be mistaken i'll have to tell those unfortunates who have put their trust in men that they must place it in god and their own strength again i thank you tell me where i shall take you elias your bitter words touch my heart and make me also doubt what do you want i was not brought up among the people so i am perhaps ignorant of their needs i spent my childhood in the jesuit college i grew up in europe i have been moulded by books learning only what men have been able to bring to light what remains among the shadows what the writers do not tell that i am ignorant of yet i love our country as you do not only because it is the duty of every man to love the country to which he owes his existence and to which he will no doubt owe his final rest not only because my father so taught me but also because my mother was an indian because my fondest recollections cluster around my country and i love it also because to it i owe and shall ever owe my happiness 
and I, because to it I owe my misfortunes, muttered Elias. Yes, my friend, I know that you suffer, that you are unfortunate, and that those facts make you look into the future darkly and influence your way of thinking, so I am somewhat forearmed against your complaints. If I could understand your motives, something of your past... My misfortunes had another source. If I thought that the story of them would be of any use, I would relate it to you, since, apart from the fact that I make no secret of it, it is quite well known to many. Perhaps, on hearing it, I might correct my opinions. You know that I do not trust much to theories, preferring rather to be guided by facts. Elias remained thoughtful for a few moments. If that is the case, sir, I will tell you my story briefly. End of chapter 49Chapter 50 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 50. Elias's Story. Some sixty years ago, my grandfather dwelt in Manila, being employed as a bookkeeper in a Spanish commercial house. He was then very young, was married, and had a son. One night, from some unknown cause, the warehouse burned down. The fire was communicated to the dwelling of his employer, and from there to many other buildings. The losses were great, a scapegoat was sought, and the merchant accused my grandfather. In vain he protested his innocence, but he was poor and unable to pay the great lawyers, so he was condemned to be flogged publicly and paraded through the streets of Manila. Not so very long since, they still used the infamous method of punishment which the people call the caballo y vaca, and which is a thousand times more dreadful than death itself. Abandoned by all except his young wife, my grandfather saw himself tied to a horse, followed by an unfeeling crowd, and whipped on every street corner in the sight of men, his brothers, and in the neighborhood of numerous temples of a god of peace. When the wretch, now forever disgraced, had satisfied the vengeance of man with his blood, his tortures, and his cries, he had to be taken off the horse, for he had become unconscious. Would to God that he had died! But by one of those refinements of cruelty he was given his liberty. His wife, pregnant at the time, vainly begged from door to door for work or alms in order to care for her sick husband and their poor son, but who would trust the wife of an incendiary and a disgraced man? The wife, then, had to become a prostitute. Ibarra rose in his seat. Oh, don't get excited. Prostitution was not now a dishonor for her or a disgrace to her husband. For them, honor and shame no longer existed. The husband recovered from his wounds and came with his wife and child to hide himself in the mountains of this province. Here they lived several months, miserable, alone, hated, and shunned by all. The wife gave birth to a sickly child, which fortunately died. Unable to endure such misery and being less courageous than his wife, my grandfather, in despair at seeing his sick wife deprived of all care and assistance, hanged himself. His corpse rotted in sight of the son, who was scarcely able to care for his sick mother, and the stench from it led to their discovery. Her husband's death was attributed to her, for of what is the wife of a wretch, a woman who has been a prostitute besides, not believed to be capable? If she swears, they call her a perjurer. If she weeps, they say that she is acting, and that she blasphemes when she calls on God. Nevertheless, they had pity on her condition and waited for the birth of another child before they flogged her. You know how the friars spread the belief that the Indians can only be managed by blows, Read what Padre Gaspar de San Agustin says. A woman thus condemned will curse the day on which her child is born, and this, besides prolonging her torture, violates every maternal sentiment. Unfortunately, she brought forth a healthy child. Two months afterwards, the sentence was executed to the great satisfaction of the men who thought that thus they were performing their duty. Not being at peace in these mountains, she then fled with her two sons to a neighbouring province, where they lived like wild beasts, hating and hated. The elder of the two boys still remembered, even amid so much misery, the happiness of his infancy, so he became a tulisan as soon as he found himself strong enough. 
Before long the bloody name of Balat spread from province to province, a terror to the people, because in his revenge he did everything with blood and fire. The younger, who was by nature kind-hearted, resigned himself to his shameful fate along with his mother, and they lived on what the woods afforded, clothing themselves in the cast-off rags of travellers. She had lost her name, being only known as the convict, the prostitute, the scourged. He was known as the son of his mother only, because the gentleness of his disposition led everyone to believe that he was not the son of the incendiary, and because any doubt as to the morality of the Indians can be held reasonable. At last, one day the notorious Balat fell into the clutches of the authorities, who exacted of him a strict accounting for his crimes, and of his mother for having done nothing to rear him properly. One morning the younger brother went to look for his mother, who had gone into the woods to gather mushrooms and had not returned. He found her stretched out on the ground under a cotton tree beside the highway, her face turned toward the sky, her eyes fixed and staring, her clenched hands buried in the blood-stained earth. Some impulse moved him to look up in the direction toward which the eyes of the dead woman were staring, and he saw hanging from a branch a basket, and in the basket the gory head of his brother. "'My God!' ejaculated Ibarra. "'That might have been the exclamation of my father,' continued Elias coldly. The body of the brigand had been cut up and the trunk buried, but his limbs were distributed and hung up in different towns. If you ever go from Calamba to Santo Tomas, you will still see a withered lomboy tree where one of my uncle's legs hung rotting. Nature has blasted the tree so that it no longer grows or bears fruit.' The same was done with the other limbs, but the head, as the best part of the person and the portion most easily recognizable, was hung up in front of his mother's hut. Ibarra bowed his head. The boy fled like one accursed, Elias went on. He fled from town to town by mountain and valley. When he thought that he had reached a place where he was not known, he hired himself out as a laborer in the house of a rich man in the province of Tayabas. His activity and the gentleness of his character gained him the good will of all who did not know his past, and by his thrift and economy he succeeded in accumulating a little capital. He was still young, he thought his sorrows buried in the past, and he dreamed of a happy future. His pleasant appearance, his youth, and his somewhat unfortunate condition won him the love of a young woman of the town, but he dared not ask for her hand, from fear that his past might become known. But love is stronger than anything else, and they wandered from the straight path. So, to say the woman's honour, he risked everything by asking for her in marriage. The records were sought, and his whole past became known. The girl's father was rich and succeeded in having him prosecuted. He did not try to defend himself, but admitted everything, and so was sent to prison. The woman gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl, who were nurtured in secret and made to believe that their father was dead. No difficult matter, since at a tender age they saw their mother die, and they gave little thought to tracing genealogies. As our maternal grandfather was rich, our childhood passed happily. My sister and I were brought up together, loving one another as only twins can love when they have no other affections. When quite young I was sent to study in the Jesuit college, and my sister, in order that we might not be completely separated, entered the Concordia College. After our brief education was finished, since we desired only to be farmers, we returned to the town to take possession of the inheritance left us by our grandfather. We lived happily for a time, the future smiled on us, we had many servants, our fields produced abundant harvests, and my sister was about to be married to a young man whom she adored, and who responded equally to her affection. But in a dispute over money, and by reason of my haughty disposition at that time, I alienated the goodwill of a distant relative, and one day he cast in my face my doubtful birth and shameful descent. I thought it all slender and demanded satisfaction. The tomb which covered so much rottenness was again opened, and to my consternation the whole truth came out to overwhelm me. To add to our sorrow we had had for many years an old servant who had endured all my whims without ever leaving us, contenting himself merely with weeping and groaning at the rough jests of the other servants. I don't know how my relative had found it out, but the fact is that he had this old man summoned into court and made him tell the truth, 
that old servant who had clung to his beloved children and whom i had abused many times was my father our happiness faded away i gave up our fortune my sister lost her betrothed and with our father we left the town to seek refuge elsewhere the thought that he had contributed to our misfortunes shortened the old man's days but before he died i learned from his lips the whole story of the sorrowful past my sister and i were left alone she wept a great deal but even in the midst of such great sorrows as heaped themselves upon us she could not forget her love without complaining without uttering a word she saw her former sweetheart married to another girl but i watched her gradually sicken without being able to console her one day she disappeared and it was in vain that i sought everywhere in vain i made inquiries about her about six months afterwards i learned that about that time after a flood on the lake there had been found in some rice fields bordering on the beach at kalamba the corpse of a young woman who had been either drowned or murdered for she had had so they said a knife sticking in her breast the officials of that town published the fact in the country round about but no one came to claim the body no young woman apparently had disappeared from the description they gave me afterward of her dress her ornaments the beauty of her countenance and her abundant hair i recognized in her my poor sister since then i have wandered from province to province my reputation and my history are in the mouths of many they attribute great deeds to me sometimes calumniating me but i pay little attention to men keeping ever on my way such in brief is my story a story of one of the judgments of men Elias fell silent as he rode along. "'I still believe that you are not wrong,' murmured Chrysostomo in a low voice. "'When you say that justice should seek to do good by rewarding virtue and educating the criminals. Only it's impossible, utopian. And where could be secured so much money, so many new employees?' "'For what, then, are the priests who proclaim their mission of peace and charity?' It is more meritorious to moisten the head of a child with water to give it salt to eat than to awake in the benighted conscience of a criminal that spark which god has granted to every man to light him to his welfare is it more humane to accompany a criminal to the scaffold than to lead him along the difficult path from vice to virtue don't they also pay spies executioners civil guards these things besides being dirty also cost money my friend neither you nor i although we may wish it can accomplish this alone it is true we are nothing but take up the cause of the people unite yourself with the people be not heedless of their cries set an example to the rest spread the idea of what is called a fatherland what the people ask for is impossible we must wait wait to wait means to suffer if i should ask for it the powers that be would laugh at me but if the people supported you never i will never be the one to lead the multitude to get by force what the government does not think proper to grant no if i should ever see that multitude armed i would place myself on the side of the government for in such a mob i should not see my countrymen i desire the country's welfare therefore i would build a schoolhouse I seek it by means of instruction, by progressive advancement. Without light there is no road. Neither is there liberty without strife, answered Elias. The fact is that I don't want that liberty. The fact is that without liberty there is no light, replied the pilot with warmth. You say that you are only slightly acquainted with your country, and I believe you. You don't see the struggle that is preparing. You don't see the cloud on the horizon. The fight is beginning in the sphere of ideas to descend later into the arena which will be dyed with blood. I hear the voice of God, who woe unto them who would oppose it. For them history has not been written. Elias was transfigured, standing uncovered, with his manly face illuminated by the moon, there was something extraordinary about him. He shook his long hair and went on. Don't you see how everything is awakening? The sleep has lasted for centuries, but one day the thunderbolt struck and in striking infused life. 
since then new tendencies are stirring our spirits and these tendencies today scattered will some day be united guided by the god who has not failed other peoples and who will not fail us for his cause is the cause of liberty a solemn silence followed these words while the banker carried along insensibly by the waves neared the shore elias was the first to break the silence what shall i tell those who sent me he asked with a change from his former tone i've already told you i greatly deplore their condition but they should wait evils are not remedied by other evils and in our misfortunes each of us has his share of blame elias did not again reply but dropped his head and rode along until they reached the shore where he took leave of ibarra i thank you sir for the condescension you have shown me now for your own good i beg of you that in the future you forget me and that you do not recognize me again no matter in what situation you may find me so saying he drew away in the banka rowing toward a thicket on the shore as he covered the long distance he remained silent apparently intent upon nothing but the thousands of phosphorescent diamonds that the oar caught up and drawed back into the lake where they disappeared mysteriously into the blue waves when he had reached the shadow of the thicket a man came out of it and approached the banker what shall i tell the capitan he asked tell him that elias if he lives will keep his word was the sad answer when will you join us then when your capitan thinks that the hour of danger has come very well good-bye if i don't die first added elias in a low voice end of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of the social cancer a complete english version of noli me tangere from the spanish of jose rizal by charles darbisher this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in january two thousand and twelve chapter fifty one exchanges the bashful linares was anxious and ill at ease he had just received from doña victorina a letter which ran thus dear cousin within three days i expect to hear from you if the alferez has killed you or you him i don't want another day to pass before that brute has his punishment if that time passes and you haven't challenged him i'll tell don santiago you was never secretary nor joked with canobas nor went on a spree with the general don arsenio martinez i'll tell clarita it is all a humbug and i'll not give you a cent more if you challenge him i promise all you want so let's see you challenge him i warn you there must be no excuses no delays your cousin who loves you victorina de los reyes de de espadaña san paloc monday seven in the evening the affair was serious he was well enough acquainted with the character of doña victorina to know what she was capable of to talk to her of reason was to talk of honesty and courtesy to a revenue carbineer when he proposes to find contraband when there is none to plead with her would be useless to deceive her worse there was no way out of the difficulty but to send a challenge but how suppose he receives me with violence he soliloquized as he paced to and fro suppose i find him with his senora who will be willing to be my second the curate capitan tiago oh, damn the hour in which i listened to her advice the old toady to oblige me to get myself tangled up to tell lies to make a blustering fool of myself what will the young lady say about me now i'm sorry that i've been secretary to all the ministers while the good Linares was in the midst of his soliloquy, Padre Salvi came in. The Franciscan was even thinner and paler than usual, but his eyes gleamed with a strange light, and his lips wore a peculiar smile. Signor Linares, all alone, was his greeting as he made his way to the sala, through the half-open door of which floated the notes from a piano. Linares tried to smile. Where is Don Santiago? 
continued the curate. Capitan Tiago at that moment appeared, kissed the curate's hand, and relieved him of his hat and cane, smiling all the while like one of the blessed. "'Come, come!' exclaimed the curate, entering the sala, followed by Linares and Capitan Tiago. "'I have good news for you all. I have just received letters from Manila which confirm the one Señor Ibarra brought me yesterday. So, Don Santiago, the objection is removed.' Maria Clara, who was seated at the piano between her two friends, partly rose, but her strength failed her and she fell back again. Linares turned pale and looked at Capitan Tiago, who dropped his eyes. "'The young man seems to me to be very agreeable,' continued the curate. "'At first I misjudged him. He's a little quick-tempered. But he knows so well how to atone for his faults afterwards that one can't hold anything against him. If it were not for Padre Damaso, Here the curate shot a quick glance at Maria Clara, who was listening without taking her eyes off the sheet of music, in spite of the sly pinching of Sinang, who was thus expressing her joy. Had she been alone, she would have danced. Padre Damaso? queried Linares. Yes, Padre Damaso has said, the curate went on, without taking his gaze from Maria Clara, that as, being her sponsor in baptism, he can't permit. But after all, I believe that if Signor Ibarra begs his pardon, which I don't doubt he'll do, everything will be settled. Maria Clara rose, made some excuse, and retired to her chamber, accompanied by Victoria. But if Padre Damaso doesn't pardon him, asked Capitan Tiago in a low voice, then Maria Clara will decide. Padre Damaso is her father, spiritually. But I think they'll reach an understanding. At that moment footsteps were heard and Ibarra appeared, followed by Aunt Isabel. His appearance produced varied impressions. To his affable greeting, Capitan Tiago did not know whether to laugh or to cry. He acknowledged the presence of Linares with a profound bow. Fray Salvi arose and extended his hand so cordially that the youth could not restrain a look of astonishment. "'Don't be surprised,' said Fray Salvi, "'for I was just now praising you.' Ibarra thanked him and went up to Sinang, who began with her childish garrulity. "'Where have you been all day? We were all asking, what can that soul redeemed from purgatory have gone? And we all said the same thing.' "'May I know what you said?' "'No, that's a secret.' but I'll tell you soon alone. Now, tell me where you've been so we can see who guessed right. No, that's also a secret, but I'll tell you alone if these gentlemen will excuse us. Certainly, certainly, by all means, exclaimed Padre Salvi. Rejoicing over the prospect of learning a secret, Sinang led Crisostomo to one end of the sala. Tell me, little friend, he asked, is Maria angry with me? I don't know, but she says that it's better for you to forget her. Then she begins to cry. Capitan Tiago wants her to marry that man. So does Padre Damaso, but she doesn't say either yes or no. This morning, when we were talking about you, and I said, Suppose he has gone to make love to some other girl? She answered, Would that he had, and began to cry. Ibarra became grave. Tell Maria that I want to talk with her alone. Alone? asked Sinang, wrinkling her eyebrows and staring at him. Entirely alone, no, but not with that fellow present. It's rather difficult, but don't worry, I'll tell her. When shall I have an answer? Tomorrow, come to my house early. Maria doesn't want to be left alone at all, so we stay with her. Victoria sleeps with her one night and I the other, and tonight it's my turn. But listen, your secret. Are you going away without telling me? That's right. I was in the town of Los Banos. I'm going to develop some coconut groves, and I'm thinking of putting up an oil mill. Your father will be my partner. Nothing more than that? <laughs> what a secret! exclaimed Sinang aloud, in the tone of a cheated usurer. I thought... Be careful. I don't want you to make it known. Nor do I want to do it, replied Sinang, turning up her nose. If it were something more important, I would tell my friends. But to buy coconuts, 
Coconuts! Who's interested in coconuts? And with extraordinary haste she ran to join her friends. A few minutes later Ibarra, seeing that the interest of the party could only languish, took his leave. Capitan Tiago wore a bittersweet look. Linares was silent and watchful, while the curate with assumed cheerfulness talked of indifferent matters. None of the girls had reappeared. End of chapter 51Chapter 52 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 52. The Cards of the Dead and the Shadows. The moon was hidden in a cloudy sky, while a cold wind, precursor of the approaching December, swept the dry leaves and dust about in the narrow pathway leading to the cemetery. Three shadowy forms were conversing in low tones under the arch of the gateway. "'Have you spoken to Elias?' asked a voice. "'No, you know how reserved and circumspect he is. But he ought to be one of us. Don Crisostomo saved his life.' "'That's why I joined,' said the first voice. "'Don Crisostomo had my wife cured in the house of a doctor in Manila. "'I'll look after the convento to settle some old scores with the curate. "'And we'll take care of the barracks to show the civil guards that our father had sons.' "'How many of us will there be?' Five, and five will be enough. "'Don Crisostomo's servant, though, says there'll be twenty of us.' What if you don't succeed? Hist! exclaimed one of the shadows, and all fell silent. In the semi-obscurity a shadowy figure was seen to approach, sneaking along by the fence. From time to time it stopped as if to look back. Nor was reason for this movement lacking, since some twenty paces behind it came another figure, larger and apparently darker than the first, but so lightly did it touch the ground that it vanished as rapidly as though the earth had swallowed it every time the first shadow paused and turned. "'They're following me,' muttered the first figure. "'Can it be the civil guards? Did the senior sacristan lie?' "'They said that they would meet here,' thought the second shadow. "'Some mischief must be on foot when the two brothers conceal it from me.' At length the first shadow reached the gateway of the cemetery. The three who were already there stepped forward. "'Is that you? Is that you? "'We must scatter, for they've followed me. "'Tomorrow you'll get the arms, and tomorrow night is the time. "'The cry is, Viva Don Crisostomo! "'Go!' The three shadows disappeared behind the stone walls. The later arrival hid in the hollow of the gateway and waited silently. "'Let's see who's following me,' he thought. The second shadow came up very cautiously and paused as if to look about him. "'I'm late,' he muttered, "'but perhaps they will return.' A thin fine rain which threatened to last began to fall, so it occurred to him to take refuge under the gateway. Naturally he ran against the other. "'Ah! Who are you?' asked the latest arrival in a rough tone. "'Who are you?' returned the other calmly, after which there followed a moment's pause as each tried to recognize the other's voice and to make out his features. "'What are you waiting here for?' asked he of the rough voice. "'For the clock to strike eight so that I can play cards with the dead. I want to win something tonight,' answered the other in a natural tone. And you? What have you come for? For... for the same purpose. Ah, bah, I'm glad of that. I'll not be alone. I've brought cards. At the first stroke of the bell, I'll make the lay. At the second, I'll deal. The cards that move are the cards of the dead, and we'll have to cut for them. Have you brought cards? No. Then how... It's simple enough. Just as you're going to deal for them, so I expect them to play for me. But what if the dead don't play? What can we do? 
Gambling hasn't yet been made compulsory among the dead. A short silence ensued. Are you armed? How are you going to fight with the dead? With my fists, answered the larger of the two. Oh, the devil! Now I remember. The dead won't bet when there's more than one living person, and there are two of us. Is that right? Well, I don't want to leave. Nor I. I'm short of money, answered the smaller. But let's do this. Let's play for it. The one who loses to leave. All right, agreed the other, rather ungraciously. Then let's get inside. Have you any matches? They went in to seek in the semi-obscurity for a suitable place, and soon found a niche in which they could sit. The shorter took some cards from his salakot, while the other struck a match, in the light from which they stared at each other, but from the expressions on their faces apparently without recognition. Nevertheless, we can recognize in the taller and deep-voiced one Elias, and in the shorter one from the scar on his cheek, Lucas. Cut, called Lucas, still staring at the other. He pushed aside some bones that were in the niche and dealt an ace and a jack. Elias lighted match after match. On the jack, he said, and to indicate the card placed the vertebra on top of it. Play, called Lucas, as he dealt an ace with the fourth or fifth card. You've lost, he added. Now leave me alone so that I can try to make a raise. Elias moved away without a word and was soon swallowed up in the darkness. Several minutes later the church clock struck eight and the bell announced the hour of the souls, but Lucas invited no one to play, nor did he call on the dead, as the superstition directs. Instead he took off his hat and muttered a few prayers, crossing and recrossing himself with the same fervour with which, at the same moment, the leader of the Brotherhood of the Holy Rosary was going through a similar performance. Throughout the night a drizzling rain continued to fall. By nine o'clock the streets were dark and solitary. The coconut oil lanterns which the inhabitants were required to hang out scarcely illuminated a small circle around each, seeming to be lighted only to render the darkness more apparent. Two civil guards paced back and forth in the street near the church. "'It's cold,' said one in Tagalog with a Visayan accent. "'We haven't caught any sacristan, so there's no one to repair the Alfares's chicken coop. They're all scared out by the death of that other one. It makes me tired.' "'Me too,' answered the other. No one commits robbery, no one raises a disturbance, but thank God they say that Elias is in town. The Alferes says that whoever catches him will be exempt from floggings for three months. Aha. Uh -huh. Do you remember his description? asked the Visayan. I should say so. Height, tall, according to the Alferes, medium, according to Padre Damaso, color, Brown, eyes, black, nose, ordinary, beard, none, hair, black. Uh-huh. Special marks? Black shirt, black pantaloons, woodcutter. Ah, he won't get away from me. I think I see him now. I wouldn't mistake him for anyone else, even though he might look like him. Thus the two soldiers continued on their road. By the light of the lanterns we may again see two shadowy figures moving cautiously along, one behind the other. An energetic, Quien vive? stops both, and the first answers, España! in a trembling voice. The soldiers seize him and hustle him toward a lantern to examine him. It is Lucas, but the soldiers seem to be in doubt, questioning each other with their eyes. The Alfares didn't say that he had a scar whispered the Visayan. Where are you going? To order a mass for tomorrow. Haven't you seen Elias? I don't know him, sir, answered Lucas. I didn't ask if you know him, you fool. Neither do we know him. I'm asking you if you've seen him. No, sir. Listen, I'll describe him. Height, sometimes tall, sometimes medium. Hair and eyes, black, all the other features, ordinary recited the Visayan. 
Now do you know him? No, sir, replied Lucas stupidly. Then get away from here, brute, dolt, and they gave him a shove. Do you know why Elias is tall to the alferez and of medium height to the curate? asked the Tagalog thoughtfully. No, answered the Visayan. Because the alferez was down in the mud hole when he saw him, and the curate was on foot. That's right, exclaimed the Visayan. You're talented. How is it that you're a civil guard? I wasn't always one, I was a smuggler, answered the Tagalog with a touch of pride. But another shadowy figure diverted their attention. They challenged this one also and took the man to the light. This time it was the real Elias. Where are you going? To look for a man, sir, who beat and threatened my brother. He has a scar on his face and is called Elias. Uh-huh, exclaimed the two guards, gazing at each other in astonishment as they started on the run toward the church, where Lucas had disappeared a few moments before. End of chapter 52Chapter 53 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 53. Il buon di si conosce da mattina. Early the next morning the report spread through the town that many lights had been seen in the cemetery on the previous night. The leader of the venerable tertiary order spoke of lighted candles, of their shape and size, and, although he could not fix the exact number, had counted more than twenty. Sister Sipa, of the Brotherhood of the Holy Rosary, could not bear the thought that a member of a rival order should alone boast of having seen this divine marvel, so she, even though she did not live near the place, had heard cries and groans, and even thought she recognized by their voices certain persons with whom she, in other times, but out of Christian charity she not only forgave them but prayed for them and would keep their names secret, for all of which she was declared on the spot to be a saint. Sister Rufa was not so keen of hearing, but she could not suffer that Sister Sipa had heard so much and she nothing, so she related a dream in which there had appeared before her many souls, not only of the dead but even of the living, souls in torment who begged for a part of those indulgences of hers which were so carefully recorded and treasured. She could furnish names to the families interested and only asked for a few alms to succour the Pope in his needs. A little fellow, a herder, who dared to assert that he had seen nothing more than one light and two men in salakots, had difficulty in escaping with mere slaps and scoldings. Vainly he swore to it. There were his carabaos with him and could verify his statement. Do you pretend to know more than the warden and the sisters, Parakmason, heretic? He was asked amid angry looks. The curate went up into the pulpit and preached about purgatory so fervently that the pesos again flowed forth from their hiding places to pay for masses. But let us leave the suffering souls and listen to the conversation between Don Filippo and old Tassio in the lonely home of the latter. The sage or lunatic was sick, having been for days unable to leave his bed, prostrated by a malady that was rapidly growing worse. Really, I don't know whether to congratulate you or not that your resignation has been accepted. Formerly, when the gobernador Theo so shamelessly disregarded the will of the majority, it was right for you to tender it, but now that you are engaged in a contest with the civil guard, it's not quite proper. In time of war, you ought to remain at your post. Yes, but not when the general sells himself, answered Don Filippo. You know that on the following morning the gobernador Theo liberated the soldiers that I had succeeded in arresting and refused to take any further action. Without the consent of my superior officer, I could do nothing. You alone, nothing, but with the rest, much. 
You should have taken advantage of this opportunity to set an example to the other towns. Above the ridiculous authority of the gobernador Theo are the rights of the people. It was the beginning of a good lesson, and you have neglected it. But what could I have done against the representative of the interests? Here you have Signor Ibarra, he has bowed before the beliefs of the crowd. Do you think that he believes in excommunications? You are not in the same fix. Signor Ibarra is trying to sow the good seed, and to do so he must bend himself and make what use he can of the material at hand. Your mission was to stir things up, and for that purpose initiative and force are required. Besides, the fight should not be considered as merely against the gobernador Theo. The principle ought to be against him who makes wrong use of his authority, against him who disturbs the public peace, against him who fails in his duty. You would not have been alone, for the country is not the same now that it was twenty years ago. Do you think so? asked Don Filippo. Don't you feel it? rejoined the old man, sitting up in his bed. Ah, that is because you haven't seen the past. You haven't studied the effect of European immigration, of the coming of new books, and of the movement of our youth to Europe. Examine and compare these facts. It is true that the Royal and Pontifical University of Santo Tomas, with its most sapient faculty, still exists, and that some intelligences are yet exercised in formulating distinctions and in penetrating the subtleties of scholasticism. But where will you now find the metaphysical youth of our days, with their archaic education, who tortured their brains and died in full pursuit of sophistries in some corner of the provinces, without ever having succeeded in understanding the attributes of being, or solving the problem of essence and existence, those lofty concepts that made us forget what was essential, our own existence and our own individuality? Look at the youth of today. Full of enthusiasm at the view of a wider horizon, they study history, mathematics, geography, literature, physical sciences, languages, all subjects that in our times we heard mentioned with horror as though they were heresies. The greatest freethinker of my day declared them inferior to the classifications of Aristotle and the laws of the syllogism. Man has at last comprehended that he is man. He has given up analyzing his God and searching into the imperceptible, into what he has not seen. He has given up framing laws for the phantasms of his brain. He comprehends that his heritage is the vast world, dominion over which is within his reach, Weary of his useless and presumptuous toil, he lowers his head and examines what surrounds him. See how poets are now springing up among us. The muses of nature are gradually opening up their treasures to us and begin to smile in encouragement on our efforts. The experimental sciences have already borne their first fruits. Time only is lacking for their development." The lawyers of today are being trained in the new forms of the philosophy of law. Some of them begin to shine in the midst of the shadows which surround our courts of justice, indicating a change in the course of affairs. Hear how the youth talk, visit the centers of learning. Other names resound within the walls of the schools. There where we heard only those of St. Thomas, Suarez, Amat, Sanchez, and others who were the idols of our times. In vain do the friars cry out from the pulpits against our demoralization, as the fish vendors cry out against the cupidity of their customers, disregarding the fact that their wares are stale and unserviceable. In vain do the conventors extend their ramifications to check the new current. The gods are going. The roots of the tree may weaken the plants that support themselves under it, but they cannot take away life from those other beings, which, like birds, are soaring toward the sky. The sage spoke with animation, his eyes gleamed. Still, the new seed is small, objected Don Filippo incredulously. If all enter upon the progress we purchase so dearly, it may be stifled. Stifled? Who will stifle it? Man, that weak dwarf, stifled progress, the powerful child of time and action? When has he been able to do so? 
bigotry, the gibbet, the stake, by endeavouring to stifle it, have hurried it along. E pur si muove, said Galileo, when the Dominicans forced him to declare that the earth does not move, and the same statement might be applied to human progress. Some wills are broken down, some individuals sacrificed, but that is of little import. Progress continues on its way, and from the blood of those who fall, new and vigorous offspring is born. See, the press itself, however backward it may wish to be, is taking a step forward. The Dominicans themselves do not escape the operation of this law, but are imitating the Jesuits, their irreconcilable enemies. They hold fiestas in their cloisters, they erect little theatres, they compose poems, because, as they are not devoid of intelligence, in spite of believing in the 15th century, they realize that the Jesuits are right, and they will still take part in the future of the younger peoples that they have reared. So, according to you, the Jesuits keep up with progress? asked Don Filippo in wonder. Why, then, are they opposed in Europe? I will answer you like an old scholastic, replied the sage, lying down again and resuming his jesting expression. There are three ways in which one may accompany the course of progress, in front of, beside, or behind it. The first, guide it, the second suffer themselves to be carried along with it, and the last are dragged after it, and to these last the Jesuits belong. They would like to direct it, but as they see that it is strong and has other tendencies, they capitulate, preferring to follow rather than to be crushed or left alone among the shadows by the wayside. Well now, we in the Philippines are moving along at least three centuries behind the car of progress. We are barely beginning to emerge from the Middle Ages. Hence the Jesuits, who are reactionary in Europe when seen from our point of view, represent progress. To them the Philippines owns her dawning system of instruction in the natural sciences, the soul of the nineteenth century, as she owed to the Dominicans scholasticism, already dead in spite of Leo the Thirteenth, for there is no pope who can revive what common sense has judged and condemned. But what are we getting to? he asked with a change of tone. Ah, we were speaking of the present condition of the Philippines. Yes, we are now entering upon a period of strife, or rather I should say that you are, for my generation belongs to the night, we are passing away. This strife is between the past, which seizes and strives with curses to cling to the tottering feudal castle, and the future, whose song of triumph may be heard from afar amid the splendors of the coming dawn, bringing the message of good news from other lands. Who will fall and be buried in the mouldering ruins? The old man paused. Noticing that Don Filippo was gazing at him thoughtfully, he said with a smile, I can almost guess what you are thinking. Really? You are thinking of how easily I may be mistaken, was the answer with a sad smile. Today I am feverish and I am not infallible, Homo sum et nihil humani a me alienum puto, said Terence, and if at any time one is allowed to dream, why not dream pleasantly in the last hours of life? And after all, I have lived only in dreams. You are right, it is a dream. Our youths think only of love affairs and dissipations. They expend more time and work harder to deceive and dishonor a maiden than in thinking about the welfare of their country. Our women, in order to care for the house and family of God, neglect their own. Our men are active only in vice and heroic only in shame. Childhood develops amid ignorance and routine. Youth lives its best years without ideals, and a sterile manhood serves only as an example for corrupting youth. <laughs> Gladly do I die. Claudite iam rivos pueri. Don't you want some medicine? asked Don Filippo in order to change the course of the conversation which had darkened the old man's face. The dying need no medicines. You who remain need them. Tell Don Crisostomo to come and see me tomorrow, for I have some important things to say to him. In a few days I am going away. 
the Philippines is in darkness. After a few moments more of talk, Don Filippo left the sick man's house, grave and thoughtful. End of chapter 53Chapter 54 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 54. Revelations. Quid quid latet at parebit, nil inultum remanebit. The vesper bells are ringing, and at the holy sound all pause, drop their tasks, and uncover. The laborer returning from the fields seizes the song with which he was pacing his carabao and murmurs a prayer. The women in the street cross themselves and move their lips affectedly so that none may doubt their piety. A man stops caressing his gamecock and recites the Angelus to bring better luck, while inside the houses they pray aloud. Every sound but that of the Ave Maria dies away, becomes hushed. Nevertheless, the curate, without his hat, rushes across the street to the scandalizing of many old women, and, greater scandal still, directs his steps toward the house of the alferez. The devout women then think it time to seize the movement of their lips in order to kiss the curate's hand, but Padre Salvi takes no notice of them. This evening he finds no pleasure in placing his bony hand on his Christian nose, that he may slip it down dissemblingly, as Doña Consolación has observed, over the bosom of the attractive young woman who may have bent over to receive his blessing. Some important matter must be engaging his attention when he thus forgets his own interests and those of the church. In fact, he rushes headlong up the stairway and knocks impatiently at the alferez's door. The latter puts in his appearance, scowling, followed by his better half, who smiles like one of the damned. Ah, padre, I was just going over to see you, that old goat of yours. I have a very important matter. I can't stand for his running about and breaking down the fence. I'll shoot him if he comes back. That is, if you are alive tomorrow, exclaimed the panting curate as he made his way toward the sala. What? Do you think that puny doll will kill me? I'll bust him with a kick. Padre Salvi stepped backward with an involuntary glance toward the alferez's feet. Whom are you talking about? he asked tremblingly. About whom would I talk but that simpleton who has challenged me to a duel with revolvers at a hundred paces? Ah, sighed the curate, then he added, I've come to talk to you about a very urgent matter. Enough of urgent matters. It'll be like that affair of the two boys. Had the light been other than from coconut oil and the lamp globe not so dirty, the alferez would have noticed the curate's pallor. Now, this is a serious matter, which concerns the lives of all of us, declared Padre Salvi in a low voice. A serious matter, echoed the alferez, turning pale. Can that boy shoot straight? I'm not talking about him. Then what? The friar made a sign toward the door, which the alferez closed in his own way, with a kick, for he had found his hands superfluous, and had lost nothing by ceasing to be by manus. A curse and a roar sounded outside. Brute! You've split my forehead open! yelled his wife. Now, unburden yourself, he said calmly to the curate. The latter stared at him for a space, then asked in the nasal droning voice of the preacher, didn't you see me come running? Sure, I thought you'd lost something. Well, now, continued the curate without heeding the alferez's rudeness, when I fail thus in my duty, it's because there are grave reasons. Well, what else? asked the other, tapping the floor with his foot. Be calm, 
Then why did you come in such a hurry? The curate drew nearer to him and asked mysteriously, Haven't you heard anything? The alferez shrugged his shoulders. You admit that you know absolutely nothing? Do you want to talk about Elias, who put away your senior sacristan last night? was the retort. No, I'm not talking about those matters, answered the curate ill-naturedly. I'm talking about a great danger. Well, damn it, out with it. Come, said the friar slowly and disdainfully. You see once more how important we ecclesiastics are. The meanest lay brother is worth as much as a regiment, while the curate... Then he added in a low and mysterious tone, I've discovered a big conspiracy. The alfares stared up and gazed in astonishment at the friar. A terrible and well-organized plot which will be carried out this very night. This very night, exclaimed the alfares, pushing the curate aside and running to his revolver and sword hanging on the wall. Who'll I arrest? Who'll I arrest? he cried. Calm yourself. There is still time, thanks to the promptness with which I have acted. We have till eight o'clock. I'll shoot all of them. Listen. This afternoon a woman whose name I can't reveal, it's a secret of the confessional, came to me and told everything. At eight o'clock they will seize the barracks by surprise, plunder the convento, capture the police boat, and murder all of us Spaniards. The alferez was stupefied. The woman did not tell me any more than this, added the curate. She didn't tell any more? Then I'll arrest her. I can't consent to that. The bar of penitence is the throne of the God of Mercies. There's neither God nor mercies that amount to anything. I'll arrest her. You're losing your head. What you must do is get yourself ready. Muster your soldiers quietly and put them in ambush. Send me four guards for the convento and notify the men in charge of the boat. The boat isn't here. I'll ask for help from the other sections. No! for then the plotters would be warned and would not carry out their plans. What we must do is to catch them alive and make them talk. I mean, you will make them talk, since I, as a priest, must not meddle in such matters. Listen, here's where you win crosses and stars. I ask only that you make due acknowledgement that it was I who warned you. It'll be acknowledged, padre, it'll be acknowledged, and perhaps you'll get a mitre, answered the glowing alferez, glancing at the cuffs of his uniform. So you sent me four guards, in plain clothes, eh? Be discreet, and tonight at eight o'clock it'll rain stars and crosses. While all this was taking place, a man ran along the road leading to Ibarra's house and rushed up the stairway. Is your master here? The voice of Elias called to a servant. He's in his study at work. Ibarra, to divert the impatience that he felt while waiting for the time when he could make his explanations to Maria Clara, had set himself to work in his laboratory. "'Ah, that you, Elias!' he exclaimed. "'I was thinking about you. Yesterday I forgot to ask you the name of that Spaniard in whose house your grandfather lived. "'Let's not talk about me, sir. Look!' continued Ibarra, not noticing the youth's agitation, while he placed a piece of bamboo over a flame. I've made a great discovery. This bamboo is incombustible. It's not a question of bamboo now, sir. It's a question of your collecting your papers and fleeing at this very moment. Ibarra glanced at him in surprise, and, on seeing the gravity of his countenance, dropped the object that he held in his hands. Burn everything that may compromise you, and within an hour put yourself in a place of safety. Why? Ibarra was at length able to ask. Put all your valuables in a safe place. Why? Burn every letter written by you or to you. The most innocent thing may be wrongly construed. 
but why all this why because i've just discovered a plot that is to be attributed to you in order to ruin you a plot who is forming it i haven't been able to discover the author of it but just a moment ago i talked with one of the poor dupes who are paid to carry it out and i wasn't able to dissuade him but he didn't he tell you who is paying him yes under a pledge of secrecy he said that it was you my god exclaimed the terrified ibarra there's no doubt of it sir don't lose any time for the plot will probably be carried out this very night ibarra with his hands on his head and his eyes staring unnaturally seemed not to hear him the blow cannot be averted continued elias i've come late i don't know who the leaders are save yourself sir save yourself for your country's sake whither shall i flee she expects me to-night exclaimed ibarra thinking of maria clara to any town whatsoever to manila to the house of some official but anywhere so that they may not say that you are directing this movement suppose that i myself report the plot you an informer exclaimed elias stepping back and staring at him you would appear as a traitor and coward in the eyes of the plotters and faint-hearted in the eyes of others they would say that you planned the whole thing to carry favour they would say but what's to be done i've already told you destroy every document that relates to your affairs flee and await the outcome and maria clara exclaimed the young man no i'll die first elias wrung his hands saying well then at least parry the blow prepare for the time when they accuse you ibarra gazed about him in bewilderment then help me there in that writing desk are all the letters of my family select those of my father which are perhaps the ones that may compromise me read the signatures so the bewildered and stupefied young man opened and shut boxes collected papers read letters hurriedly tearing up some and laying others aside he took down some books and began to turn their leaves elias did the same if not so excitedly yet with equal eagerness but suddenly he paused his eyes bulged he turned the paper in his hand over and over then asking in a trembling voice was your family acquainted with don pedro ibaramendia i should say so answered ibarra as he opened a chest and took out a bundle of papers he was my great-grandfather your great-grandfather don pedro ibaramendia again asked elias with changed and livid features yes replied ibarra absently we shortened the surname it was too long was he a basque demanded elias approaching him yes a basque but what's the matter asked ibarra in surprise clenching his fists and pressing them to his forehead elias glared at chrysostomo who recoiled when he saw the expression on the other's face do you know who don pedro ibaramendia was he asked between his teeth Don Pedro Ibaramendia was the villain who falsely accused my grandfather and caused all our misfortunes. I have sought for that name and God has revealed it to me. Render me now an accounting for our misfortunes. Elias caught and shook the arm of Chrysostomo, who gazed at him in terror. In a voice that was bitter and trembling with hate, he said, Look at me well, look at one who has suffered, and you live, you live, you have wealth, a home, reputation, you live, you live. Beside himself he ran to a small collection of arms and snatched up a dagger. But scarcely had he done so when he let it fall again and stared like a madman at the motionless Ibarra. What was I about to do? He muttered, fleeing from the house. End of chapter 54。
Recording by Hawaii in January 2012. Chapter 55 The Catastrophe There in the dining room, Capitan Tiago, Linares, and Aunt Isabel were at supper, so that even in the sala the rattling of plates and dishes was plainly heard. Maria Clara had said that she was not hungry and had seated herself at the piano in company with the merry Sinang, who was murmuring mysterious words into her ear. Meanwhile, Padre Salvi paced nervously back and forth in the room. It was not, indeed, that the convalescent was not hungry, no, but she was expecting the arrival of a certain person and was taking advantage of this moment when her Argus was not present, Linares' supper hour. "'You'll see how that spectre will stay till eight, murmured Sinang, indicating the curate, "'and at eight he will come. The curate's in love with Linares.' Maria Clara gazed in consternation at her friend, who went on heedlessly with her terrible chatter. "'Oh, I don't know why he doesn't go, in spite of my hints. He doesn't want to burn up oil in the convento. Don't you know that since you've been sick the two lamps that he used to keep lighted he has put out?' But look how he stares, and what a face! At that moment a clock in the house struck eight. The curate shuddered and sat down in a corner. Here he comes! exclaimed Sinang, pinching Maria Clara. Don't you hear him? The church bell boomed out the hour of eight, and all rose to pray. Padre Salvi offered up a prayer in a weak and trembling voice, but as each was busy with his own thoughts, no one paid any attention to the priest's agitation. Scarcely had the prayer ceased when Ibarra appeared. The youth was in mourning not only in his attire, but also in his face, to such an extent that, on seeing him, Maria Clara arose and took a step toward him to ask what the matter was. But at that instant the report of firearms was heard. Ibarra stopped, his eyes rolled, he lost the power of speech. The curate had concealed himself behind a post. More shots, more reports were heard from the direction of the convento, followed by cries and the sound of persons running. Capitan Tiago, Aunt Isabel and Linares rushed in pell-mell, crying, Tulisan! Tulisan! Andeng followed, flourishing the gridiron as she ran toward her foster sister. Aunt Isabel fell on her knees weeping and reciting the Kyrie eleison. Capitan Tiago, pale and trembling, carried on his fork a chicken liver which he offered tearfully to the Virgin of Antipolo. Linares, with his mouth full of food, was armed with a case-knife. Sinang and Maria Clara were in each other's arms, while the only one that remained motionless, as if petrified, was Crisostomo, whose paleness was indescribable. The cries and sound of blows continued, windows were closed noisily, the report of a gun was heard from time to time. Christi eleison! Santiago, let the prophecy be fulfilled! Shut the windows! groaned Aunt Isabel. Fifty big bombs and two thanksgiving masses, responded Capitan Tiago. Ora pro nobis! Gradually there prevailed a heavy silence which was soon broken by the voice of the alferes, calling as he ran, Padre, Padre Salvi, come here. Miserere, the alferes is calling for confession, cried Aunt Isabel. The alferes is wounded, asked Linares hastily. Ah! Only then did he notice that he had not yet swallowed what he had in his mouth. Padre, come here, there's nothing more to fear. The alferes continued to call out. The pallid Frey Salvi at last concluded to venture out from his hiding-place and went down the stairs. "'The outlaws have killed the alferes. Maria, Sinang, go to your room and fasten the door. Kyrie eleison!' Ibarra also turned toward the stairway, in spite of Aunt Isabel's cries. "'Don't go out! You haven't been shriven! Don't go out!' The good old lady had been a particular friend of his mother's. But Ibarra left the house. Everything seemed to reel around him, the ground was unstable. His ears buzzed, his legs moved heavily and irregularly. 
Waves of blood, lights and shadows chased one another before his eyes, and in spite of the bright moonlight he stumbled over the stones and blocks of wood in the vacant and deserted street. Near the barracks he saw soldiers, with bayonets fixed, who were talking among themselves so excitedly that he passed them unnoticed. In the town hall were to be heard blows, cries and curses, with the voice of the alferez dominating everything. To the stocks, handcuff them, shoot anyone who moves. Sergeant, mount the guard. Today no one shall walk about, not even God. Captain, this is no time to go to sleep. Ibarra hastened his steps toward home, where his servants were anxiously awaiting him. Saddle the best horse and go to bed, he ordered them. Going into his study, he hastily packed a travelling bag, opened an iron safe, took out what money he found there and put it into some sacks. Then he collected his jewels, took down a portrait of Maria Clara, armed himself with a dagger and two revolvers, and turned toward a closet where he kept his instruments. At that moment three heavy knocks sounded on the door. "'Who's there?' asked Ibarra in a gloomy tone. "'Open, in the king's name, open at once, or we'll break the door down!' answered an imperious voice in Spanish. Ibarra looked toward the window, his eyes gleamed, and he cocked his revolver. Then, changing his mind, he put the weapons down and went to open the door just as the servant appeared. Three guards instantly seized him. "'Consider yourself a prisoner in the king's name,' said the sergeant. "'For what? They'll tell you over there. We're forbidden to say.' The youth reflected a moment, and then, perhaps not wishing that the soldiers should discover his preparations for flight, picked up his hat, saying, "'I'm at your service. I suppose that it will only be for a few hours.' "'If you promise not to escape, we won't tie you. The Alferez grants this favour. But if you run—' Ibarra went with them, leaving his servants in consternation." Meanwhile, what had become of Elias? Leaving the house of Crisostomo, he had run like one crazed, without heeding where he was going. He crossed the fields in violent agitation, he reached the woods. He fled from the town, from the light. Even the moon so troubled him that he plunged into the mysterious shadows of the trees. There, sometimes pausing, sometimes moving along unfrequented paths, supporting himself on the hoary trunks or being entangled in the undergrowth he gazed toward the town which bathed in the light of the moon spread out before him on the plain along the shore of the lake birds awakened from their sleep flew about huge bats and owls moved from branch to branch with strident cries and gazed at him with their round eyes but elias neither heard nor heeded them in his fancy he was followed by the offended shades of his family. He saw on every branch the gruesome basket containing Balat's gory head, as his father had described it to him. At every tree he seemed to stumble over the corpse of his grandmother. He imagined that he saw the rotting skeleton of his dishonoured grandfather swinging among the shadows, and the skeleton and the corpse and the gory head cried after him, Coward! Coward! Leaving the hill, Elias descended to the lake and ran along the shore excitedly. There, at a distance in the midst of the waters, where the moonlight seemed to form a cloud, he thought he could see a spectre rise and soar, the shade of his sister, with her breast bloody and her loose hair streaming about. He fell to his knees on the sand, and extending his arms, cried out, "'You too!' Then, with his gaze fixed on the cloud, he arose slowly and went forward into the water as if he were following someone. He passed over the gentle slope that forms the bar and was soon far from the shore. The water rose to his waist, but he plunged on like one fascinated, following, ever following the ghostly charmer. Now the water covered his chest. A volley of rifle shots sounded. The vision disappeared, the youth returned to his senses. 
in the stillness of the night and the greater density of the air the reports reached him clearly and distinctly he stopped to reflect and found himself in the water over the peaceful ripples of the lake he could still make out the lights in the fishermen's huts he returned to the shore and started toward the town but for what purpose he himself knew not the streets appeared to be deserted the houses were closed and even the dogs that were wont to bark through the night had hidden themselves in fear the silvery light of the moon added to the sadness and loneliness Fearful of meeting the civil guards, he made his way along through yards and gardens, in one of which he thought he could discern two human figures, but he kept on his way, leaping over fences and walls, until after great labour he reached the other end of the town and went toward Chrysostomo's house. In the doorway were the servants, lamenting their master's arrest. After learning about what had occurred, Elias pretended to go away, but really went around behind the house, jumped over the wall, and crawled through a window into the study where the candle that Ibarra had lighted was still burning. He saw the books and papers and found the arms, the jewels, and the sacks of money. Reconstructing in his imagination the scene that had taken place here, and seeing so many papers that might be of a compromising nature, he decided to gather them up, throw them from the window, and bury them. But on glancing toward the street he saw two guards approaching, their bayonets and caps gleaming in the moonlight. With them was the director Theo. He made a sudden resolution. Throwing the papers and some clothing into a heap in the centre of the room, he poured over them the oil from a lamp and set fire to the hole. He was hurriedly placing the arms in his belt when he caught sight of the portrait of Maria Clara and hesitated a moment then thrust it into one of the sacks, and with them in his hands leaped from the window into the garden. It was time that he did so, too, for the guards were forcing an entrance. "'Let us in to get your master's papers,' cried the director Theo. "'Have you permission? If you haven't, you won't get in,' answered an old man. But the soldiers pushed him aside with the butts of their rifles and ran up the stairway, just as a thick cloud of smoke rolled through the house and long tongues of flame shot out from the study, enveloping the doors and windows. "'Fire! Fire!' was the cry as each rushed to save what he could. But the blaze had reached the little laboratory and caught the inflammable materials there, so the guards had to retire." The flames roared about, licking up everything in their way and cutting off the passages. Vainly was water brought from the well and cries for help raised, for the house was set apart from the rest. The fire swept through all the rooms and set toward the sky thick spirals of smoke. Soon the whole structure was at the mercy of the flames, fanned now by the wind, which in the heat grew stronger. Some few rustics came up, but only to gaze on this great bonfire, the end of that old building which had been so long respected by the elements. End of chapter 55Chapter 56 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in January 2012. Chapter 54. Rumors and Beliefs Day dawned at last for the terrified town. The streets near the barracks and the town hall were still deserted and solitary. The houses showed no signs of life. Nevertheless, the wooden panel of a window was pushed back noisily, and a child's head was stretched out and turned from side to side, gazing about in all directions. At once, however, a smack indicated the contact of tanned hide with the soft human article, so the child made a wry face, closed its eyes, and disappeared. The window slammed shut. But an example had been set— that opening and shutting of the window had no doubt been heard on all sides, 
for soon another window opened slowly and there appeared cautiously the head of a wrinkled and toothless old woman it was the same sister Pute who had raised such a disturbance while padre damaso was preaching children and old women are the representatives of curiosity in this world the former from a wish to know things and the latter from a desire to recollect them apparently there was no one to apply a slipper to sister Pute, for she remained gazing out into the distance with wrinkled eyebrows then she rinsed out her mouth spat noisily and crossed herself in the house opposite another window was now timidly opened to reveal sister rufa she who did not wish to cheat or be cheated they stared at each other for a moment smiled made some signs and again crossed themselves jesus it seemed like a thanksgiving mass regular fireworks commented sister rufa since the town was sacked by Balat, I've never seen another night equal to it, responded Sister Pute. What a lot of shots! They say that it was old Pablo's band. Tulisanas? Ah, that can't be. They say that it was the cuadrilleros against the civil guards. That's why Don Filippo has been arrested. Sanctus Deus! They say that at least fourteen were killed. Other windows were now opened, and more faces appeared to exchange greetings and make comments. In the clear light, which promised a bright day, soldiers could be seen in the distance, coming and going confusedly like grey silhouettes. "'There goes one more corpse!' was the exclamation from a window. "'One? I see two. "'And I—but really, can it be you don't know what it was?' asked a sly-featured individual. Oh, the cuadrilleros! No, sir, it was a mutiny in the barracks. What kind of mutiny? The curate against the alferez? No, it was nothing of the kind, answered the man who had asked the first question. It was the Chinamen who have rebelled. With this he shut his window. The Chinamen! echoed all in great astonishment. That's why not one of them is to be seen. They've probably killed them all. I thought they were going to do something bad. Yesterday, I saw it myself, last night. What a pity, exclaimed Sister Rufa, to get killed just before Christmas when they bring around their presents. They should have waited until New Year's. Little by little the street awoke to life. Dogs, chickens, pigs, and doves began the movement, and these animals were soon followed by some ragged urchins who held fast to each other's arms as they timidly approached the barracks. Then a few old women with handkerchiefs tied about their heads and fastened under their chins appeared with thick rosaries in their hands, pretending to be at their prayers so that the soldiers would let them pass. When it was seen that one might walk about without being shot at, the men began to come out with assumed airs of indifference. First they limited their steps to the neighborhood of their houses, caressing their gamecocks. Then they extended their stroll, stopping from time to time, until at last they stood in front of the town hall. In a quarter of an hour other versions of the affair were in circulation. Ibarra with his servants had tried to kidnap Maria Clara, and Capitan Tiago had defended her, aided by the civil guard. The number of killed was now not fourteen, but thirty. Capitan Tiago was wounded and would leave that very day with his family for Manila. The arrival of two cuadrilleros carrying a human form on a covered stretcher and followed by a civil guard produced a great sensation. It was conjectured that they came from the convento, and, from the shape of the feet which were dangling over one end, some guessed who the dead man might be, someone else a little distance away told who it was. Further on the corpse was multiplied, and the mystery of the Holy Trinity duplicated. Later the miracle of the loaves and fishes was repeated, and the dead were then thirty and eight. By half-past seven, when other guards arrived from neighboring towns, the current version was clear and detailed. I've just come from the town hall, where I've seen Don Filippo and Don Crisostomo prisoners, a man told Sister Pute. 
I've talked with one of the cuadrilleros who are on guard. Well, Bruno, the son of that fellow who was flogged to death, confessed everything last night. As you know, Capitan Tiago is going to marry his daughter to the young Spaniard, so Don Crisostomo in his rage wanted to get revenge and tried to kill all the Spaniards, even the curate. Last night they attacked the barracks and the convento, but fortunately, by God's mercy, the curate was in Capitan Tiago's house. They say that a lot of them escaped. The civil guards burned Don Crisostomo's house down, and if they hadn't arrested him first, they would have burned him also. They burned the house down? All the servants are under arrest. Look, you can still see the smoke from here, answered the narrator, approaching the window. Those who come from there tell of many sad things. All looked toward the place indicated. A thin column of smoke was still slowly rising toward the sky. All made comments, more or less pitying, more or less accusing. Poor youth, exclaimed an old man, Pute's husband. Yes, she answered, but look how he didn't order a mass said for the soul of his father, who undoubtedly needs it more than others. But woman, haven't you any pity? Pity for the excommunicated? It's a sin to take pity on the enemies of God, the curate say. Don't you remember? In the cemetery he walked about as if he was in a coral. But a coral and the cemetery are alike, replied the old man. Only that into the former only one kind of animal enters. Shut up, cried Sister Pute. You still defend those whom God has clearly punished. You'll see how they arrest you too. You're upholding a falling house. Her husband became silent before this argument. Yes, continued the old lady. After striking Padre Damaso, there wasn't anything left for him to do but to kill Padre Salvi. But you can't deny that he was good when he was a little boy. Yes, he was good, replied the old woman. But he went to Spain, and those that go to Spain become heretics, as the curates have said. Oh, exclaimed her husband, seeing his chance for a retort. And the curate, and all the curates, and the archbishop, and the pope, and the virgin, aren't they from Spain? Are they also heretics? Abba! Happily for Sister Pute, the arrival of a maidservant running, all pale and terrified, cut short this discussion. A man hanged in the next garden, she cried breathlessly. A man hanged, exclaimed all in stupefaction. The women crossed themselves. No one could move from his place. Yes, sir, went on the trembling servant. I was going to pick peas. I looked into our neighbor's garden to see if it was... I saw a man swinging. I thought it was Theo, the servant who always gives me... I went nearer to pick the peas, and I saw that it wasn't Theo, but a dead man. I ran, and I ran, and... Let's go see him, said the old man, rising. Show us the way. Don't you go, cried Sister Pute, catching hold of his camisa. Something will happen to you. Is he hanged? Then the worse for him. Let me see him, woman. You, Juan, go to the barracks and report it. Perhaps he's not dead yet. So he proceeded to the garden with the servant who kept behind him. The women, including even Sister Pute herself, followed after, filled with fear and curiosity. There he is, sir, said the servant as she stopped and pointed with her finger. The committee paused at a respectful distance and allowed the old man to go forward alone. A human body hanging from the branch of a santal tree swung about gently in the breeze. The old man stared at it for a time and saw that the legs and arms were stiff, the clothing soiled and the head doubled over. We mustn't touch him until some officer of the law arrives, he said aloud. He's already stiff. He's been dead for some time. The women gradually moved closer. He's the fellow who lived in that little house there. He came here two weeks ago. Look at the scar on his face. Ave Maria, exclaimed some of the women. 
"'Shall we pray for his soul?' asked a young woman after she had finished staring and examining the body. "'Fool! Heretic!' scolded Sister Putte. "'Don't you know what Padre Damaso said? "'It's tempting God to pray for one of the damned. "'Whoever commits suicide is irrevocably damned, "'and therefore he isn't buried in holy ground.' "'Then she added, "'I knew that this man was coming to a bad end. "'I never could find out how he lived.' "'I saw him twice talking with the senior sacristan,' observed a young woman. "'It wouldn't be to confess himself or to order a mass.' Other neighbours came up until a large group surrounded the corpse, which was still swinging about. After half an hour, an alguazil and the director Theo arrived with two cuadrilleros, who took the body down and placed it on a stretcher. "'People are getting in a hurry to die.' remarked the director Theo with a smile as he took a pen from behind his ear. He made captious inquiries and took down the statement of the maidservant, whom he tried to confuse, now looking at her fiercely, now threatening her, now attributing to her things that she had not said, so much so that she, thinking that she would have to go to jail, began to cry and wound up by declaring that she wasn't looking for peace, but, and she called Theo as a witness. While this was taking place, a rustic in a wide salakot with a big bandage on his neck was examining the corpse and the rope. The face was not more livid than the rest of the body. Two scratches and two red spots were to be seen above the noose, the strands of the rope were white and had no blood on them. The curious rustic carefully examined the camisa and pantaloons and noticed that they were very dusty and freshly torn in some parts. But what most caught his attention were the seeds of amores secos that were sticking on the camisa even up to the collar. "'What are you looking at?' the director Theo asked him. "'I was looking, sir, to see if I could recognize him,' stammered the rustic, partly uncovering, but in such a way that his salakot fell lower. "'But haven't you heard that it's a certain Lucas? Were you asleep?' The crowd laughed, while the abashed rustic muttered a few words and moved away slowly with his hand down. "'Hey, where are you going?' cried the old man after him. "'That's not the way out. That's the way to the dead man's house.' "'The fellow's still asleep.' remarked the director Theo facetiously. Better put some water over him. Amid the laughter of the bystanders, the rustic left the place where he had played such a ridiculous part and went toward the church. In the sacristy he asked for the senior sacristan. He's still asleep, was the rough answer. Don't you know that the convento was assaulted last night? Then I'll wait till he wakes up this with a stupid stare at the sacristans, such as is common to persons who are used to rough treatment. In a corner which was still in shadow, the one-eyed senior sacristan lay asleep in a big chair. His spectacles were placed on his forehead amid long locks of hair, while his thin, squalid chest, which was bare, rose and fell regularly. The rustic took a seat nearby as if to wait patiently, but he dropped a piece of money and started to look for it with the aid of a candle under the senior sacristan's chair. He noticed seeds of amores secos on the pantaloons and on the cuffs of the sleeper's camisa. The latter awoke, rubbed his one good eye, and began to scold the rustic with great ill-humour. "'I wanted to order a mass, sir,' was the reply in a tone of excuse. "'The masses are already over.' said the sacristan, sweetening his tone a little at this. If you want it for tomorrow, is it for the souls in purgatory? No, sir, answered the rustic, handing him a peso. Then, gazing fixedly at the single eye, he added, It's for a person who is going to die soon. Hereupon he left the sacristy. I could have caught him last night. He sighed as he took off the bandage and stood erect to recover the face and form of Elias. End of chapter 56
Chapter 57 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 57. Vae Victis. Migoso en un pozo. Guards with forbidding mien paced to and fro in front of the door of the town hall, threatening with their rifle butts the bold urchins who rose on tiptoe or climbed up on one another to see through the bars. The hall itself did not present that agreeable aspect it wore when the programme of the fiesta was under discussion. Now it was gloomy and rather ominous. The civil guards and cuadrilleros who occupied it scarcely spoke, and then with few words in low tones. At the table the director Theo, two clerks, and several soldiers were rustling papers, while the alferez strode from one side to the other, at times gazing fiercely toward the door. Prouder Themistocles could not have appeared in the Olympic Games after the Battle of Salamis. Doña Consolación yawned in a corner, exhibiting a dirty mouth and jagged teeth, while she fixed her cold, sinister gaze on the door of the jail, which was covered with indecent drawings. She had succeeded in persuading her husband, whose victory had made him amiable, to let her witness the inquiry and perhaps the accompanying tortures. The hyena smelt the carrion and licked herself, wearied by the delay. The gobernador Theo was very compunctious. His seat, that large chair placed under His Majesty's portrait, was vacant, being apparently intended for someone else. About nine o'clock the curate arrived, pale and scowling. "'Well, you haven't kept yourself waiting,' the alferez greeted him. "'I should prefer not to be present.' replied Padre Salvi in a low voice, paying no heed to the bitter tone of the alferez. I am very nervous. As no one else has come to fill the place, I judge that your presence... You know that they leave this afternoon. Young Ibarra and the Teniente Mayor. The alferez pointed toward the jail. There are eight there, he said. Bruno died at midnight, but his statement is on record. The curate saluted Doña Consolación, who responded with a yawn, and took his seat in the big chair under His Majesty's portrait. "'Let us begin,' he announced. "'Bring out those two who are in the stocks,' ordered the alferez in a tone that he tried to make as terrible as possible. Then, turning to the curate, he added with a change of tone, "'They are fastened in by skipping two holes.' For the benefit of those who are not informed about these instruments of torture, we will say that the stocks are one of the most harmless. The holes in which the offender's legs are placed are a little more or less than a foot apart. By skipping two holes, the prisoner finds himself in a rather forced position, with peculiar inconvenience to his ankles and a distance of about a yard between his lower extremities. It does not kill instantaneously, as may well be imagined. The jailer, followed by four soldiers, pushed back the bolt and opened the door. A nauseating odour and currents of thick, damp air escaped from the darkness, within at the same time that laments and sighs were heard. A soldier struck a match, but the flame was choked in such a foul atmosphere, and they had to wait until the air became fresher. In the dim light of the candle several human forms became vaguely outlined, men hugging their knees or hiding their heads between them, some lying face downward, some standing, and some turned toward the wall. A blow and a creak were heard, accompanied by curses. The stocks were opened, Doña Consolación bent forward with the muscles of her neck swelling and her bulging eyes fixed on the half-opened door. A wretched figure, Tarsilo, Bruno's brother, came out between two soldiers. On his wrists were handcuffs and his clothing was in shreds, revealing quite a muscular body. 
he turned his eyes insolently on the alfarese's woman. This is the one who defended himself with the most courage and told his companions to run, said the alfarez to Padre Salvi. Behind him came another of miserable aspect, moaning and weeping like a child. He limped along, exposing pantaloons spotted with blood. Mercy, sir, mercy! I'll not go back into the yard, he whimpered. He's a rogue observed the alferez to the curate. He tried to run, but he was wounded in the thigh. These are the only two that we took alive. What's your name? the alferez asked Tarsilo. Tarsilo a la cigan. What did Don Crisostomo promise you for attacking the barracks? Don Crisostomo never had anything to do with us. Don't deny it. That's why you tried to surprise us. You're mistaken. You beat our father to death and we were avenging him. Nothing more. Look for your two associates. The alferez gazed at the sergeant in surprise. They're over there in the gully where we threw them yesterday and where they'll rot. Now kill me. You'll not learn anything more. General surprise and silence, broken by the alferez. You are going to tell who your other accomplices are, he threatened, flourishing a rattan whip. A smile of disdain curled the prisoner's lips. The alferez consulted with the curate in a low tone for a few moments, then turned to the soldiers. Take him out where the corpses are, he commanded. On a cart in a corner of the yard were heaped five corpses, partly covered with a filthy piece of torn matting. A soldier walked about near them, spitting at every moment. "'Do you know them?' asked the alferez, lifting up the matting. Tarsilo did not answer. He saw the corpse of the madwoman's husband with two others, that of his brother, slashed with bayonet thrusts, and that of Lucas, with the halter still around his neck. His look became sombre, and a sigh seemed to escape from his breast. "'Do you know them?' he was again asked, but he still remained silent. The air hissed, and the rattan cut his shoulders. He shuddered, his muscles contracted. The blows were redoubled, but he remained unmoved. "'Whip him until he bursts or talks!' cried the exasperated alferez. Talk now, the director Theo advised him. He'll kill you anyhow. They led him back into the hall, where the other prisoner, with chattering teeth and quaking limbs, were calling upon the saints. Do you know this fellow? asked Padre Salvi. This is the first time that I've ever seen him, replied Tarsilo with a look of pity at the other. The alferez struck him with his fist and kicked him. Tie him to the bench! Without taking off the handcuffs, which were covered with blood, they tied him to a wooden bench. The wretched boy looked about him as if seeking something and noticed Doña Consolación, at sight of whom he smiled sardonically. In surprise, the bystanders followed his glance and saw the senora, who was lightly gnawing at her lips. I've never seen an uglier woman! exclaimed Tarsilo in the midst of a general silence. I'd rather lie down on a bench as I do now than at her side as the alferez does. The muse turned pale. You're going to flog me to death, Senor Alferez, he went on, but tonight your woman will revenge me by embracing you. Gag him! yelled the furious alferez, trembling with wrath. Tarsilo seemed to have desired the gag, for after it was put in place his eyes gleamed with satisfaction. At a signal from the alferez, a guard armed with a rattan whip began his gruesome task. Tarsilo's whole body contracted, and a stifled, prolonged cry escaped from him in spite of the piece of cloth which covered his mouth. His head drooped and his clothes became stained with blood. 
Padre Salvi, pallid and with wandering looks, arose laboriously, made a sign with his hand, and left the hall with faltering steps. In the street he saw a young woman leaning with her shoulders against a wall, rigid, motionless, listening attentively, staring into space, her clenched hands stretched out along the wall. The sun beat down upon her fiercely. She seemed to be breathlessly counting those dry, dull strokes and those heart-rending groans. It was Tarsilo's sister. Meanwhile, the scene in the hall continued. The wretched boy, overcome with pain, silently waited for his executioners to become weary. At last the panting soldier let his arm fall, and the alferez, pale with anger and astonishment, made a sign for them to untie him. Doña Consolación then arose and murmured a few words into the ear of her husband, who nodded his head in understanding. "'To the well with him!' he ordered. The Filipinos know what this means. In Tagalog they call it timbain. We do not know who invented this procedure, but we judge that it must be quite ancient. Truth at the bottom of a well may perhaps be a sarcastic interpretation. In the centre of the yard rose the picturesque curb of a well, roughly fashioned from living rock. A rude apparatus of bamboo in the form of a well sweep served for drawing up the thick, slimy, foul-smelling water. Broken pieces of pottery, manure and other refuse were collected there, since this well was like the jail, being the place for what society rejected or found useless, and any object that fell into it, however good it might have been, was then a thing lost. Yet it was never closed up, and even at times the prisoners were condemned to go down and deepen it, not because there was any thought of getting anything useful out of such punishment, but because of the difficulties the work offered. A prisoner who once went down there would contract a fever from which he would surely die. Tarsilo gazed upon all the preparations of the soldiers with a fixed look. He was pale and his lips trembled or murmured a prayer. The haughtiness of his desperation seemed to have disappeared, or, at least, to have weakened. Several times he bent his stiff neck and fixed his gaze on the ground as though resigned to his sufferings. They led him to the well curb, followed by the smiling Doña Consolación. In his misery he cast a glance of envy toward the heap of corpses, and a sigh escaped from his breast. "'Talk now!' the director Theo again advised him. They'll hang you anyhow. You'll at least die without suffering so much. You'll come out of this only to die, added a quadriero. They took away the gag and hung him up by his feet, for he must go down head foremost and remain some time under the water, just as the bucket does, only that the man is left a longer time. While the alferez was gone to look for a watch to count the minutes, Tarsilo hung with his long hair streaming down and his eyes half closed. "'If you are Christians, if you have any heart,' he begged in a low voice, "'let me down quickly, or make my head strike against the sides so that I'll die. God will reward you for this good deed. Perhaps some day you may be as I am.' The alferez returned, watch in hand, to superintend the lowering. "'Slowly! Slowly!' cried Doña Consolación, as she kept her gaze fixed on the wretch. "'Be careful!' The well-sweep moved gently downwards. Tarsilo rubbed against the jutting stones and filthy weeds that grew in the crevices. Then the sweep stopped, while the alferez counted the seconds. "'Lift him up!' he ordered at the end of a half-minute. The silvery and harmonious tinkling of the drops of water falling back indicated the prisoner's return to the light. Now that the sweep was heavier, he rose rapidly. Pieces of stone and pebbles torn from the walls fell noisily. His forehead and hair smeared with filthy slime, his head covered with cuts and bruises, 
his body wet and dripping, he appeared to the eyes of the silent crowd. The wind made him shiver with cold. "'Will you talk?' he was asked. "'Take care of my sister,' murmured the unhappy boy as he gazed beseechingly toward one of the cuadrilleros. The bamboo sweep again creaked, and the condemned boy once more disappeared. Doña Consolación observed that the water remained quiet. The alferez counted a minute. When Tarsilo again came up, his features were contracted and livid. With his bloodshot eyes wide open, he looked at the bystanders. "'Are you going to talk?' the alferez again demanded in dismay. Tarsilo shook his head, and they again lowered him. His eyelids were closing as the pupils continued to stare at the sky where the fleecy clouds floated. He doubled back his neck so that he might still see the light of day, but all too soon he had to go down into the water, and that foul curtain shut out the sight of the world from him forever. A minute passed. The watchful muse saw large bubbles rise to the surface of the water. "'He's thirsty!' she commented with a laugh. The water again became still. This time the alferez did not give the signal for a minute and a half. Tarsilo's features were now no longer contracted. The half-raised lids left the whites of his eyes showing, from his mouth poured muddy water streaked with blood, but his body did not tremble in the chill breeze. Pale and terrified, the silent bystanders gazed at one another. The alferez made a sign that they should take the body down, and then moved away thoughtfully. Doña Consolación applied the lighted end of her cigar to the bare legs, but the flesh did not twitch, and the fire was extinguished. "'He strangled himself,' murmured a cuadrillero. "'Look at how he turned his tongue back as if trying to swallow it.' The other prisoner, who had watched this scene, sweating and trembling, now stared like a lunatic in all directions. The alferez ordered the director Theo to question him. "'Sir, sir,' he groaned, "'I'll tell everything you want me to.' "'Good. Let's see. What's your name?' "'Andong, sir.' "'Bernardo, Leonardo, Ricardo, Eduardo, Gerardo.' Or what? Andong, sir, repeated the imbecile. Put it down, Bernardo, or whatever it may be, dictated the alferez. Surname? The man gazed at him in terror. What name have you that is added to the name Andong? Ah, sir, Andong, the witless, sir. The bystanders could not restrain a smile. Even the alferez paused in his pacing about. Occupation? Pruner of coconut trees, sir, and servant of my mother-in-law. Who ordered you to attack the barracks? No one, sir. What, no one? Don't lie about it or into the well you go. Who ordered you? Say truly. Truly, sir. Who? Who, sir? I'm asking you who ordered you to start the revolution. What revolution, sir? This one, for you were in the yard by the barracks last night. Ah, sir, exclaimed Andong, blushing. Who's guilty of that? My mother-in-law, sir. Surprise and laughter followed these words. The alferez stopped and stared not unkindly at the wretch who, thinking that his words had produced a good effect, went on with more spirit. Yes, sir, my mother-in-law doesn't give me anything to eat but what is rotten and unfit, so last night when I came by here with my belly aching, I saw the yard of the barracks near, and I said to myself, It's night time, no one will see me. I went in, and then many shots sounded. A blow from the rattan cut his speech short. To the jail, ordered the alferez. This afternoon to the capital. 
End of chapter 57「Chapter 58 of The Social Cancer – A Complete English Version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 58 – The Accursed Soon the news spread through the town that the prisoners were about to set out. At first it was heard with terror, afterward came the weeping and wailing. The families of the prisoners ran about in distraction, going from the convento to the barracks, from the barracks to the town hall, and finding no consolation anywhere, filled the air with cries and groans. The curate had shut himself up on a plea of illness. The alferez had increased the guards who received the supplicating women with the butts of their rifles. The gobernadorcillo, at best a useless creature, seemed to be more foolish and more useless than ever. In front of the jail the women, who still had strength enough, ran to and fro, while those who had not sat down on the ground and called upon the names of their beloved. Although the sun beat down fiercely, not one of these unfortunates thought of going away. Doray, the erstwhile merry and happy wife of Don Filippo, wandered about dejectedly, carrying in her arms their infant son, both weeping. To the advice of friends that she go back home to avoid exposing her baby to an attack of fever, the disconsolate woman replied, "'Why should he live if he isn't going to have a father to rear him? "'Your husband is innocent. Perhaps he'll come back.' "'Yes, after we're all dead!' Capitana Tinai wept and called upon her son Antonio. The courageous Capitana Maria gazed silently toward the small grating behind which were her twin boys, her only sons. There was present also the mother-in-law of the pruner of cocoa palms, but she was not weeping. Instead, she paced back and forth, gesticulating with uplifted arms and haranguing the crowd. Did you ever see anything like it? To arrest my Andong, to shoot at him, to put him in the stocks, to take him to the capital, and only because... because he had a new pair of pantaloons. This calls for vengeance. The civil guards are committing abuses. I swear that if I ever again catch one of them in my garden, as has often happened, I'll chop him up, I'll chop him up, or else let him try to chop me up. Few persons, however, joined in the protests of the Mussulmanish mother-in-law. Don Crisostomo is to blame for all this, sighed a woman. The schoolmaster was also in the crowd, wandering about bewildered. Nor Juan did not rub his hands, nor was he carrying his rule and plump bob. He was dressed in black, for he had heard the bad news, and, true to his habit of looking upon the future as already assured, was in mourning for Ibarra's death. At two o'clock in the afternoon, an open cart drawn by two oxen stopped in front of the town hall. This was at once set upon by the people, who attempted to unhitch the oxen and destroy it. "'Don't do that,' said Capitana Maria. "'Do you want to make them walk?' This consideration acted as a restraint on the prisoners' relatives. Twenty soldiers came out and surrounded the cart. Then the prisoners appeared. The first was Don Filippo, bound. He greeted his wife smilingly, but Dorai broke out into bitter weeping and two guards had difficulty in preventing her from embracing her husband. Antonio, the son of Capitana Tinai, appeared crying like a baby, which only added to the lamentations of his family. The witless Andong broke out into tears at sight of his mother-in-law, the cause of his misfortune. Albino, the quondam theological student, was also bound, as were Capitana Maria's twins. All three were grave and serious. The last to come out was Ibarra, unbound but conducted between two guards. 
the pallid youth looked about him for a friendly face. "'He's the one that's to blame!' cried many voices. "'He's to blame and he goes loose!' "'My son-in-law hasn't done anything and he's got handcuffs on!' Ibarra turned to the guards. "'Bind me and bind me well, elbow to elbow,' he said. "'We haven't any order. Bind me!' and the soldiers obeyed. The alferez appeared on horseback, armed to the teeth, ten or fifteen more soldiers following him. Each prisoner had his family there to pray for him, to weep for him, to bestow on him the most endearing names, all save Ibarra, who had no one, even Nor Juan and the schoolmaster having disappeared. "'Look what you've done to my husband and my son!' Dorai cried to him, Look at my poor son, you've robbed him of his father. So the sorrow of the families was converted into anger toward the young man, who was accused of having started the trouble. The alferez gave the order to set out. You're a coward, the mother-in-law of Andong cried after Ibarra. While others were fighting for you, you hid yourself, coward. May you be accursed exclaimed an old man, running along beside him. Accursed be the gold amassed by your family to disturb our peace. Accursed! Accursed! May they hang you, heretic! cried a relative of Albino's. Unable to restrain himself, he caught up a stone and threw it at the youth. This example was quickly followed, and a rain of dirt and stones fell on the wretched young man. Without anger or complaint, impassively he bore the righteous vengeance of so many suffering hearts. This was the parting, the farewell, offered to him by the people among whom were all his affections. With bowed head he was perhaps thinking of a man whipped through the streets of Manila, of an old woman falling dead at the sight of her son's head. Perhaps Elias's history was passing before his eyes. The alferez found it necessary to drive the crowd back, but the stone-throwing and the insults did not cease. One mother alone did not wreak vengeance on him for her sorrows, Capitana Maria. Motionless, with lips contracted and eyes full of silent tears, she saw her two sons move away. Her firmness, her dumb grief, surpassed that of the fabled Niobe. So the procession moved on. Of the persons who appeared at the few open windows, those who showed most pity for the youth were the indifferent and the curious. All his friends had hidden themselves, even Capitan Basilio himself, who forbade his daughter Sinang to weep. Ibarra saw the smoking ruins of his house, the home of his fathers, where he was born, were clustered the fondest recollections of his childhood and his youth. Tears long repressed started into his eyes, and he bowed his head and wept, without having the consolation of being able to hide his grief, tied as he was, nor of having any one in whom his sorrow awoke compassion. Now he had neither country, nor home, nor love, nor friends, nor future. From a slight elevation a man gazed upon the sad procession. He was an old man, pale and emaciated, wrapped in a woolen blanket, supporting himself with difficulty on a staff. It was the old sage, Tasio, who, on hearing of the event, had left his bed to be present, but his strength had not been sufficient to carry him to the town hall. The old man followed the cart with his gaze until it disappeared in the distance, and then remained for some time afterward with his head bowed, deep in thought. Then he stood up and laboriously made his way toward his house, pausing to rest at every step. On the following day some herdsmen found him dead on the very threshold of his solitary home. End of chapter 58
Chapter 59 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 59. Patriotism and Private Interests. Secretly the telegraph transmitted the report to Manila, and thirty-six hours later the newspapers commented on it with great mystery and not a few dark hints, augmented, corrected, or mutilated by the censor. In the meantime, private reports emanating from the convents were the first to gain secret currency from mouth to mouth, to the great terror of those who heard them. The fact, distorted in a thousand ways, was believed with greater or less ease, according to whether it was flattering or worked contrary to the passions and ways of thinking of each hearer. Without public tranquillity seeming disturbed, at least outwardly, yet the peace of mind of each home was whirled about like the water in a pond. While the surface appears smooth and clear, in the depths the silent fishes swarm, dive about, and chase one another. For one part of the population crosses, decorations, epaulets, offices, prestige, power, importance, dignities, began to whirl about like butterflies in a golden atmosphere. For the other part, a dark cloud arose on the horizon, projecting from its grey depths like black silhouettes, bars, chains, and even the fateful gibbet. In the air there seemed to be heard investigations, condemnations, and the cries from the torture chamber. Marianas and Bagumbayan presented themselves wrapped in a torn and bloody veil, fishers and fished confused. Fate pictured the event to the imaginations of the Manilans like certain Chinese fans, on one side painted black, the other gilded with bright-coloured birds and flowers. In the convents the greatest excitement prevailed. Carriages were harnessed, the provincials exchanged visits and held secret conferences. They presented themselves in the palaces to offer their aid to the government in its perilous crisis. Again there was talk of comets and omens. Atedeum, Atedeum, cried a friar in one convent. This time let no one be absent from the chorus. It's no small mercy from God to make it clear just now, especially in these hopeless times, how much we are worth. The little general Mal Aguero can gnaw his lips over this lesson, responded another. What would have become of him if not for the religious corporations? And to celebrate the fiesta better, serve notice on the cook and the refectioner. Gaudiamus for three days. Amen. Viva Salvi. Amen. In another convent they talked differently. You see now, that fellow is a pupil of the Jesuits. The filibusters come from the Ateneo. And the anti-friars. I told you so. The Jesuits are ruining the country, they are corrupting the youth, but they are tolerated because they trace a few scrawls on a piece of paper when there is an earthquake. And God knows how they are made. Yes, but don't contradict them. When everything is shaking and moving about, who draws diagrams? Nothing. Padre Secchi. And they smiled with sovereign disdain. But what about the weather forecasts and the typhoons? asked another ironically. Aren't they divine? Any fisherman foretells them. When he who governs is a fool, tell me how your head is, and I'll tell you how your foot is. But you'll see if the friends favor one another. The newspapers very nearly ask a mitre for Padre Salvi. He's going to get it. He'll lick it right up. Do you think so? Why not? Nowadays they grant one for anything whatsoever. I know of a fellow who got one for less. He wrote a cheap little work demonstrating that the Indians are not capable of being anything but mechanics. Pshaw, all fogeyisms. That's right, so much favorism injures religion, exclaimed another. If the mitres only had eyes and could see what heads they were upon. If the mitres were natural objects, 
added another in a nasal tone. Natura abhorre vacuum. That's why they grab for them, their emptiness attracts, responded another. These and many more things were said in the convents, but we will spare our reader other comments of a political, metaphysical, or piquant nature and conduct him to a private house. As we have few acquaintances in Manila, let us enter the home of Capitan Tinong, the polite individual whom we saw so profusely inviting Ibarra to honor him with a visit. In the rich and spacious sala of his tondo house, Capitan Tinong was seated in a wide armchair, rubbing his hands in a gesture of despair over his face and the nape of his neck, while his wife, Capitana Tinchang, was weeping and preaching to him. From the corner their two daughters listened silently and stupidly, yet greatly affected. "'Ay, Virgin of Antipolo!' cried the woman. "'Ay, Virgin of the Rosary and of the Girdle! "'Ay, ay, Our Lady of Novaliches! "'Mother!' responded the elder of the daughters. "'I told you so!' continued the wife in an accusing tone. "'I told you so!' Ay, Virgin of Carmen, ay! But you didn't tell me anything, Capitan Tinong dared to answer tearfully. On the contrary, you told me that I was doing well to frequent Capitan Tiago's house and cultivate friendship with him, because he's rich, and you told me. What? What did I tell you? I didn't tell you that. I didn't tell you anything. Ay, if you had only listened to me. Now you're throwing the blame on me, he replied bitterly, slapping the arm of his chair. Didn't you tell me that I had done well to invite him to dine with us because he was wealthy? Didn't you say that we ought to have friends only among the wealthy? Abba! It's true that I told you so because, because there wasn't anything else for me to do. You did nothing but sing his praises. Donibara here, Donibara there, Donibara everywhere. Abba! But I didn't advise you to hunt him up and talk to him at that reception. You can't deny that. Did I know that he was to be there, perhaps? But you ought to have known it. How so, if I didn't even know him? But you ought to have known him. But, Tin Chang, it was the first time that I ever saw him, that I ever heard him spoken of. Well, then, you ought to have known him before and heard him spoken of. That's what you're a man for and wear trousers and read El Diario de Manila, answered his unterrified spouse, casting on him a terrible look. To this, Capitan Tinong did not know what to reply. Capitana Tinchang, however, was not satisfied with this victory, but wished to silence him completely. So she approached him with clenched fists. Is this what I've worked for, year after year, toiling and saving, that you, by your stupidity, may throw away the fruits of my labor? She scolded. Now they'll come to deport you, they'll take away all our property, just as they did from the wife of... Oh, if I were a man, if I were a man! Seeing that her husband bowed his head, she again fell to sobbing, but still repeating, I, if I were a man, if I were a man! Well, if you were a man, the provoked husband at length asked, What would you do? What would I do? Well, well... Well, this very minute I'd go to the captain-general and offer to fight against the rebels. This very minute. But haven't you seen what the diario says? Read it. The vile and infamous treason has been suppressed with energy, strength and vigor, and soon the rebellious enemies of the fatherland and their accomplices will feel all the weight and severity of the law. Don't you see it? There isn't any more rebellion. That doesn't matter. You ought to offer yourself as they did in 72. They saved themselves. Yes, that what was done by Padre Burg. But he was unable to finish this name, for his wife ran to him and slapped her hand over his mouth. Shut up! Are you saying that name so that they may garrot you tomorrow in Bagumbayan? 
don't you know that to pronounce it is enough to get yourself condemned without trial keep quiet however capitan tinong may have felt about obeying her he could hardly have done otherwise for she had his mouth covered with both her hands pressing his little head against the back of the chair so that the poor fellow might have been smothered to death had not a new personage appeared on the scene this was their cousin don primitivo who had memorized the amat a man of some forty years plump big paunched and elegantly dressed kid video he exclaimed as he entered what's happening care ay cousin cried the woman running toward him in tears i've sent for you because i don't know what's going to become of us what do you advise speak you've studied latin and know how to argue but first quid queritis nihil est in intellectu quod prius non fuerit in sensu nihil volitum quin precognitum he sat down gravely and just as if the latin phrases had possessed a soothing virtue the couple ceased weeping and drew nearer to him to hang upon the advice from his lips as at one time the greeks did before the words of salvation from the oracle that was to free them from the persian invaders why do you weep ubinam gentium sumus you've already heard of the uprising alzamentum ibare ab alferesio garde civilis destructum et nunc what does don crisostomo owe you anything no but you know tinong invited him to dinner and spoke to him on the bridge of spain in broad daylight they'll say that he's a friend of his a friend of his exclaimed the startled latinist rising amice amicus plato said magnis amica veritas birds of a feather flock together malum est negotium et est timendum rerum istarum horrendissimum resultatum Ahem. capitan tinong turned deathly pale at hearing so many words in um such a sound presaged ill his wife clasped her hands supplicatingly and said cousin don't talk to us in latin now you know that we're not philosophers like you let's talk in spanish or tagalog give us some advice it's a pity that you don't understand latin cousin truths in latin are lies in tagalog for example contra principia negantem fustibus est arguendum in latin is a truth like noah's ark but i put it into practice once and i was the one who got whipped so it's a pity that you don't know latin in latin everything would be straightened out we too know many oremus parcenobis and agnus de catholis but now we shouldn't understand one another provide tinong with an argument so they won't hang him you're done wrong very wrong cousin in cultivating friendship with that young man replied the latinist the righteous suffer for the sinners i was almost going to advise you to make your will vae illis ubi est fumus ibi est ignis similis simili audet ad qui ibara ahorcatur ergo ahorcaberis with this he shook his head from side to side disgustedly saturnino what's the matter cried capitana tinchang in dismay ay he's dead a doctor tinong tinongoi the two daughters ran to her and all three fell to weeping it's nothing more than a swoon cousin i would have been more pleased that that but unfortunately it's only a swoon non timeo mortem in cadre set super espaldonem bagumbayanis get some water don't die sobbed the wife don't die for they'll come and arrest you ay if you die and the soldiers come ay ay the learned cousin rubbed the victim's face with water until he recovered consciousness come don't cry in veni remedium i found a remedy let's carry him to bed come take courage here i am with you and all the wisdom of the ancients call a doctor and you cousin 
go right away to the captain-general and take him a present, a gold ring, a chain. Dadivae que brandant peñas. Say that it's a Christmas gift. Close the windows, the doors, and if anyone asks for my cousin, say that he is seriously ill. Meanwhile, I'll burn all his letters, papers, and books, so that they can't find anything, just as Don Crisostomo did. Scripti testes sunt. Quod medicamenta non sanant, ferum sanat. Quod ferum non sanat, ignis sanat. Yes, do so, cousin. Burn everything, said Capitana Tinchang. Here are the keys. Here are the letters from Capitan Tiago. Burn them. Don't leave a single European newspaper, for they're very dangerous. Here are the copies of the times that I've kept for wrapping up soap and old clothes. Here are the books. Go to the Captain General, cousin, said Don Primitivo, and leave us alone. In extremis extrema. Give me the authority of a Roman dictator, and you'll see how soon I'll save the Khan. I mean, my cousin. He began to give orders and more orders, to upset bookcases, to tear up papers, books and letters. Soon a big fire was burning in the kitchen. Old shotguns were smashed with axes, rusty revolvers were thrown away. The maid-servant who wanted to keep the barrel of one for a blowpipe received a reprimand. Conservare etiam sperasti perfida? Into the fire! So he continued his auto da fe. Seeing an old volume in vellum, he read the title, Revolutions of the Celestial Globes by Copernicus. Phew! Ite maledicti in ignem calanis! He exclaimed, hurling it into the flames. Revolutions and Copernicus! Crimes on crimes! If I hadn't come in time! Liberty in the Philippines! Ta, ta, ta! What books! Into the fire! Harmless books, written by simple authors, were burned. Not even the most innocent work escaped. Cousin Primitivo was right. The righteous suffer for the sinners. Four or five hours later, at a pretentious reception in the walled city, current events were being commented upon. There were present a lot of old women and maidens of marriageable age, the wives and daughters of government employees, dressed in loose gowns, fanning themselves and yawning. Among the men, who, like the women, showed in their faces their education and origin, was an elderly gentleman, small and one-armed, whom the others treated with great respect. He himself maintained a disdainful silence. To tell the truth, formerly I couldn't endure the friars and the civil guards. They're so rude, said a corpulent dame. But now that I see their usefulness and their services, I would almost marry any one of them gladly. I am a patriot. That's what I say, added a thin lady. What a pity that we haven't our former governor. He would leave the country as clean as a platter and the whole race of filibusters would be exterminated. Don't they say that there are still a lot of islands to be populated? Why don't they deport all those crazy Indians to them? If I were the captain-general... Senoras, interrupted the one-armed individual. The captain-general knows his duty. As I've heard, he's very much irritated, for he had heaped favours on that Ibarra. "'Heaped favours on him!' echoed the thin lady, fanning herself furiously. "'Look how ungrateful these Indians are! "'Is it possible to treat them as if they were human beings? "'Jesus!' "'Do you know what I've heard?' asked a military official. "'What's that?' "'Let's hear it.' "'What do they say?' "'Reputable persons!' replied the officer in the midst of a profound silence, state that this agitation for building a schoolhouse was a pure fairy tale. Jesus, just see that! the senoras exclaimed, already believing in the trick. The school was a pretext. What he wanted to build was a fort from which he could safely defend himself when we should come to attack him. What infamy! Only an Indian is capable of such cowardly thoughts, 
exclaimed the fat lady. If I were the captain general, they would soon see... That's what I say, exclaimed the thin lady, turning to the one-armed man. Arrest all the little lawyers, priestlings, merchants, and without a trial banish or deport them. Tear out the evil by the roots. But it's said that this filibuster is the descendant of Spaniards, observed the one-armed man, without looking at any one in particular. Oh, yes, exclaimed the fat lady, unterrified. It's always the Creoles. No Indian knows anything about revolution. Rear crows, rear crows. Do you know what I've heard? asked the Creole lady to change the topic of conversation. The wife of Capitan Tinong, you remember her, the woman in whose house we danced and dined during the fiesta of Tondo. The one who has two daughters? What about her? Well, that woman just this afternoon presented the captain-general with a ring worth a thousand pesos. The one-armed man turned around. Is that so? Why? He asked with shining eyes. She said that it was a Christmas gift. But Christmas doesn't come for a month yet. Perhaps she's afraid the storm is blowing her away, observed the fat lady. And is getting under cover added the thin senora. When no return is asked, it's a confession of guilt. This must be carefully looked into, declared the one-armed man thoughtfully. I fear that there's a cat in the bag. A cat in the bag, yes, that's just what I was going to say, echoed the thin lady. And so I was. And so was I, said the other, taking the words out of her mouth. The wife of Capitan Tinong is so stingy. She hasn't yet sent us any present, and that after we've been in her house. So, when such a grasping and covetous woman lets go of a little present worth a thousand pesos. But is it a fact? inquired the one-armed man. Certainly, most certainly. My cousin's sweetheart, His Excellency's adjutant, told her so. And I'm of the opinion that it's the very same ring that her older daughter wore on the day of the fiesta. She's always covered with diamonds. A walking showcase! A way of attracting attention like any other, instead of buying a fashion plate or paying a dressmaker. Giving some pretext, the one-armed man left the gathering. Two hours later, when the world slept, various residents of Tondo received an invitation through some soldiers. The authorities could not consent to having certain persons of position and property sleep in such poorly guarded and badly ventilated houses. In Fort Santiago and other government buildings, their sleep would be calmer and more refreshing. Among these favoured persons was included the unfortunate Capitan Tinong. End of chapter 59 Chapter 60 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 60. Maria Clara Weds. Capitan Tiago was very happy, for in all this terrible storm no one had taken any notice of him. He had not been arrested, nor had he been subjected to solitary confinement, investigations, electric machines, continuous footbaths in underground cells, or other pleasantries that are well known to certain folk who call themselves civilized. His friends, that is, those who had been his friends, for the good man had denied all his Filipino friends from the instant when they were suspected by the government, had also returned to their homes after a few days' vacation in the state edifices. The captain-general himself had ordered that they be cast out from his precincts, not considering them worthy of remaining therein, to the great disgust of the one-armed individual, who had hoped to celebrate the approaching Christmas in their abundant and opulent company. 
Kapitan Tinong had returned to his home sick, pale and swollen. The excursion had not done him good. He was so changed that he said not a word, not even greeted his family, who wept, laughed, chattered, and almost went mad with joy. The poor man no longer ventured out of his house, for fear of running the risk of saying good day to a filibuster. Not even Don Primitivo himself, with all the wisdom of the ancients, could draw him out of his silence. Crede, prime, the Latinist told him, if I hadn't got here to burn all your papers, they would have squeezed your neck, and if I had burnt a whole house, they wouldn't have touched a hair of your head. But quod eventum eventum, gratias agamus domino deo, quia non in Marianis insulis es, camotes seminando. Stories similar to Capitan Tinong's were not unknown to Capitan Tiago, so he bubbled over with gratitude, without knowing exactly to whom he owed such signal favours. Aunt Isabel attributed the miracle to the Virgin of Antipolo, to the Virgin of the Rosary, or at least to the Virgin of Carmen, and at the very, very least that she was willing to concede to Our Lady of the Girdle. According to her, the miracle could not get beyond that. Capitan Tiago did not deny the miracle, but added, I think so, Isabel, but the Virgin of Antipolo couldn't have done it alone. My friends have helped, my future son-in-law, Señor Linares, who, as you know, joked with Señor Antonio Canovas himself, the premier whose portrait appears in the Illustración, he who doesn't condescend to show more than half his face to the people. So the good man could not repress a smile of satisfaction every time that he heard any important news. And there was plenty of news. It was whispered about in secret that Ibarra would be hanged, that, while many proofs of his guilt had been lacking, at least someone had appeared to sustain the accusation, that experts had declared that in fact the work on the schoolhouse could pass for a bulwark of fortification, although somewhat defective, as was only to be expected of ignorant Indians. These rumours calmed him and made him smile. In the same way that Capitan Tiago and his cousin diverged in their opinions, the friends of the family were also divided into two parties, one miraculous, the other governmental, although this letter was insignificant. The miraculous party was again subdivided. The senior sacristan of Binondo, the candlewoman, and the leader of the Brotherhood saw the hand of God directed by the Virgin of the Rosary, while the Chinese wax chandler, his caterer on his visits to Antipolo, said as he fanned himself and shook his leg, Don't fool yourself. It's the Virgin of Antipolo. She can do more than all the rest. Don't fool yourself. Capitan Tiago had great respect for this Chinese, who passed himself off as a prophet and a physician. Examining the palm of the deceased lady just before her daughter was born, he had prognosticated, If it's not a boy and doesn't die, it'll be a fine girl. And Maria Clara had come into the world to fulfill the infidel's prophecy. Capitan Tiago, then, as a prudent and cautious man, could not decide so easily as Trojan Paris. He could not so lightly give the preference to one virgin for fear of offending another, a situation that might be fraught with grave consequences. Prudence, he said to himself, let's not go and spoil it all now. He was still in the midst of these doubts when the governmental party arrived. Doña Victorina, Don Tiburcio, and Linares. Doña Victorina did the talking for the three men as well as for herself. She mentioned Linares' visits to the captain-general and repeatedly insinuated the advantages of a relative of quality. Now, she concluded, as we were saying, he who shelters himself well builds a good roof. The, the other w way, woman, corrected the doctor. For some days now she had been endeavouring to Andalusize her speech, and no one had been able to get this idea out of her head. She would sooner have first let them tear off her false frizzes. Yes, 
she went on, speaking of Ibarra. He deserves it all. I told you so when I first saw him. He's a filibuster. What did the general say to you, cousin? What did he say? What news did he tell you about this Sibara? Seeing that her cousin was slow in answering, she continued, directing her remarks to Capitan Tiago. Believe me, if they sentence him to death, as is to be hoped, it'll be on account of my cousin. Senora, senora, protested Linares. But she gave him no time for objections. How diplomatic you have become! We know that you are the adviser of the general, that he couldn't live without you. Ah, Clarita, what a pleasure to see you! Maria Clara was still pale, although now quite recovered from her illness. Her long hair was tied up with a light blue silk ribbon. With a timid bow and a sad smile, she went up to Doña Victorina for the ceremonial kiss. After the usual conventional remarks, the pseudo-Andalusian continued, "'We've come to visit you. You've been saved, thanks to your relations.' This was said with a significant glance toward Linares. "'God has protected my father,' replied the girl in a low voice. "'Yes, Clarita, but the time of the miracles is past. We Spaniards say, trust in the Virgin and take to your heels.' "'The other way.' Capitan Tiago, who had up to this point had no chance to speak, now made bold enough to ask, while he threw himself into an attitude of strict attention. So you, Doña Victorina, think that the Virgin... We've come especially to talk with you about the Virgin, she answered mysteriously, making a sign toward Maria Clara. We've come to talk business. The maiden understood that she was expected to retire, so with an excuse she went away, supporting herself on the furniture. What was said and what was agreed upon in this conference was so sordid and mean that we prefer not to recount it. It is enough to record that as they took their leave they were all merry, and that afterwards Capitan Tiago said to Aunt Isabel, "'Notify the restaurant that we'll have a fiesta tomorrow." Get Maria ready, for we're going to marry her off before long. Aunt Isabel stared at him in consternation. You'll see. When Señor Linares is our son-in-law, we'll get into all the palaces. Everyone will envy us. Everyone will die of envy. Thus it happened that at eight o'clock on the following evening the house of Capitan Tiago was once again filled, but this time his guests were only Spaniards and Chinese. The fair sex was represented by peninsular and Philippine Spanish ladies. There were present the greater part of our acquaintances, Padre Sibila and Padre Salvi, among various Franciscans and Dominicans, the old lieutenant of the civil guard, Signor Guevara, gloomier than ever, the alferez, who was for the thousandth time describing his battle and gazing over his shoulders at every one, believing himself to be a Don John of Austria, for he was now a mayor, the Esparagna, who looked at the alferez with respect and fear and avoided his gaze, and Doña Victorina, swelling with indignation. Linares had not yet come. As a personage of importance, he had to arrive later than the others. There are creatures so simple that by being an hour behind time they transform themselves into great men. In the group of women, Maria Clara was the subject of a murmured conversation. The maiden had welcomed them all ceremoniously, without losing her air of sadness. Pish! remarked one young woman. The proud little thing! Pretty little thing, responded another, but he might have picked out some other girl with a less foolish face. The gold, child, the good youth is selling himself. In another part the comments ran thus. Oh, to get married when her first fiancé is about to be hanged. That's what's called prudence, have a substitute ready. Well, when she gets to be a widow... 
Maria Clara was seated in a chair arranging a salver of flowers and doubtless heard all these remarks, for her hand trembled, she turned pale, and several times bit her lips. In the circle of men the conversation was carried on in loud tones and, naturally, turned upon recent events. All were talking, even Don Tiburcio, with the exception of Padre Sibila, who maintained his usual disdainful silence. "'I've heard it said that your reverence is leaving the town, Padre Salvi,' inquired the new mayor, whose fresh star had made him more amiable. "'I'm going to stay permanently in Manila. And you?' "'I'm also leaving the town,' answered the ex alferez swelling up. "'The government needs me to command a flying column to clean the provinces of filibusters.' Fray Sibila looked him over rapidly from head to foot, and then turned his back completely. "'Is it known for certain what will become of the ringleader, the filibuster?' inquired a government employee. "'Do you mean Crisostomo Ibarra?' asked another. "'The most likely and most just thing is that he will be hanged, like those of seventy-two. "'He's going to be deported,' remarked the old lieutenant dryly. Deported? Nothing more than deported! But it will be a perpetual deportation! exclaimed several voices at the same time. If that young man, continued the lieutenant, Guevara, in a loud and severe tone, had been more cautious, if he had confided less in certain persons with whom he corresponded, if our prosecutors did not know how to interpret so subtly what is written, that young man would surely have been acquitted. This declaration on the part of the old lieutenant and the tone of his voice produced great surprise among his hearers, who were apparently at a loss to know what to say. Padre Salvi stared in another direction, perhaps to avoid the gloomy look that the old soldier turned on him. Maria Clara let her flowers fall and remained motionless. Padre Sibila, who knew so well how to be silent, seemed also to be the only one who knew how to ask a question. "'You're speaking of letters, Señor Guevara?' "'I'm speaking of what was told me by his lawyer, who looked after the case with interest and zeal. Outside of some ambiguous lines which this youth wrote to a woman before he left for Europe— lines in which the government's attorney saw a plot and a threat against the government, and which he acknowledged to be his. There wasn't anything found to accuse him of. But the declaration of the outlaw before he died. His lawyer had that thrown out because, according to the outlaw himself, they had never communicated with the young man, but with a certain Lucas, who was an enemy of his, as could be proved, and who committed suicide, perhaps from remorse. It was proved that the papers found on the corpse were forged, since the handwriting was like that of Señor Ibarra's seven years ago, but not like his now, which leads to the belief that the model for them might have been that incriminating letter. Besides, the lawyer says that if Señor Ibarra had refused to acknowledge the letter, he might have been able to do a great deal for him. But at sight of the letter, he turned pale, lost his courage, and confirmed everything written in it. "'Did you say that the letter was directed to a woman?' asked the Franciscan. "'How did it get into the hands of the prosecutor?' The lieutenant did not answer nervously twisting the sharp point of his grey beard. The others made their comments. "'There is seen the hand of God,' remarked one. "'Even the women hate him.' "'He had his house burned down, thinking in that way to save himself. <laughs> "'But he didn't count on the guest, on his querida, his babaye,' added another, laughing. "'It's the work of God. Santiago y Sierra España.' Meanwhile, the old soldier paused in his pacing about and approached Maria Clara, who was listening to the conversation, motionless in her chair, with the flowers scattered at her feet. "'You are a very prudent girl,' the old officer whispered to her. "'You did well to give up the letter. You have thus assured yourself an untroubled future.' With startled eyes she watched him move away from her and bit her lip. 
Fortunately, Aunt Isabel came along, and she had sufficient strength left to catch hold of the old lady's skirt. Aunt, she murmured. What's the matter? asked the old lady, frightened by the look on the girl's face. Take me to my room, she pleaded, grasping her aunt's arm in order to rise. Are you sick, daughter? You look as if you'd lost your bones. What's the matter? A fainting spell, the people in the room, so many lights. I need to rest. Tell father that I'm going to sleep. You're cold. Do you want some tea? Maria Clara shook her head, entered and locked the door of her chamber, and then, her strength failing her, she fell sobbing to the floor at the feet of an image. Mother, 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 mine, she sobbed. Through the window and the door that opened on the azotea, the moonlight entered. The musicians continued to play merry waltzes. Laughter and the hum of voices penetrated into the chamber. Several times her father, Aunt Isabel, Doña Victorina, and even Linares knocked at the door, but Maria did not move. Heavy sobs shook her breast. Hours passed. The pleasures of the dinner-table ended, the sound of singing and dancing was heard, the candle burned itself out, but the maiden still remained motionless on the moonlit floor at the feet of an image of the Mother of Jesus. Gradually the house became quiet again, the lights were extinguished, and Aunt Isabel once more knocked at the door. "'Well, she's gone to sleep,' said the old woman aloud. As she is young and has no cares, she sleeps like a corpse. When all was silence, she raised herself slowly and threw a look about her. She saw the azotea with its little arbors bathed in the ghostly light of the moon. An untroubled future. She sleeps like a corpse, she repeated in a low voice as she made her way out to the azotea. The city slept. Only from time to time there was heard the noise of a carriage crossing the wooden bridge over the river, whose undisturbed waters reflected smoothly the light of the moon. The young woman raised her eyes toward a sky as clear as sapphire. Slowly she took the rings from her fingers and from her ears and removed the combs from her hair. Placing them on the balustrade of the azotea, she gazed toward the river. A small banca loaded with sacate stopped at the foot of the landing, such as every house on the bank of the river has. One of two men who were in it ran up the stone stairway and jumped over the wall, and a few seconds later his footsteps were heard on the stairs leading to the azotea. Maria Clara saw him pause on discovering her, but only for a moment. Then he advanced slowly and stopped within a few paces of her. Maria Clara recoiled. Chrysostomo, she murmured, overcome with fright. Yes, I am Chrysostomo, replied the young man gravely. An enemy, a man who has every reason for hating me, Elias, has rescued me from the prison into which my friends threw me. A sad silence followed these words. Maria Clara bowed her head and let her arms fall. Ibarra went on. Beside my mother's corpse I swore that I would make you happy, whatever might be my destiny. You can have been faithless to your oath, for she was not your mother. But I, I who am her son, hold her memory so sacred that in spite of a thousand difficulties I have come here to carry mine out, and fate has willed that I should speak to you yourself. Maria, we shall never see each other again. You are young, and perhaps some day your conscience may reproach you. I have come to tell you, before I go away forever, that I forgive you. Now, may you be happy, and farewell. Ibarra started to move away, but the girl stopped him. Chrysostomo, she said, God has sent you to save me from desperation. Hear me, and then judge me. Ibarra tried gently to draw away from her. I didn't come to call you to account. I came to give you peace. I don't want that peace which you bring me. 
Peace I will give myself. You despise me, and your contempt will embitter all the rest of my life. Ibarra read the despair and sorrow depicted in the suffering girl's face, and asked her what she wished. That you believe that I have always loved you. At this he smiled bitterly. Ah, you doubt me. You doubt the friend of your childhood, who has never hidden a single thought from you, the maiden exclaimed sorrowfully. I understand now. But when you hear my story, the sad story that was revealed to me during my illness, you will have mercy on me, you will not have that smile for my sorrow. Why did you not let me die in the hands of my ignorant physician? You and I both would have been happier. Resting a moment, she then went on. You have desired it, you have doubted me, but may my mother forgive me. On one of the sorrowfulest of my nights of suffering, a man revealed to me the name of my real father and forbade me to love you, except that my father himself should pardon the injury you had done him. Ibarra recoiled a pace and gazed fearfully at her. Yes, she continued, that man told me that he could not permit our union since his conscience would forbid it, and that he would be obliged to reveal the name of my real father at the risk of causing a great scandal, for my father is... And she murmured into the youth's ear a name in so low a tone that only he could have heard it. What was I to do? Must I sacrifice to my love the memory of my mother, the honor of my supposed father, and the good name of the real one? Could I have done that without having even you despise me? But the proof! Had you any proof? You needed proofs! exclaimed Ibarra, trembling with emotion. The maiden snatched two papers from her bosom. Two letters of my mother's, two letters written in the midst of her remorse while I was yet unborn. Take them, read them, and you will see how she cursed me and wished for my death which my father vainly tried to bring about with drugs. These letters he had forgotten in a building where he had lived. The other man found and preserved them, and only gave them up to me in exchange for your letter, in order to assure himself, so he said, that I would not marry you without the consent of my father. Since I have been carrying them about me in place of your letter, I have felt the chill in my heart. I sacrificed you, I sacrificed my love. What else could one do for a dead mother and two living fathers? Could I have suspected the use that was to be made of your letter? Ibarra stood appalled while she continued. What more was left for me to do? Could I perhaps tell you who my father was? Could I tell you that you should beg forgiveness of him who made your father suffer so much? Could I ask my father that he forgive you? Could I tell him that I knew that I was his daughter, him who desired my death so eagerly? It was only left to me to suffer, to guard the secret, and to die suffering. Now, my friend, now that you know the sad history of your poor Maria, will you still have for her that disdainful smile? Maria, you're an angel! Then I am happy, since you believe me. But yet, added the youth with a change of tone, I've heard that you're going to be married. Yes, sobbed the girl. My father demands the sacrifice. He has loved me and cared for me when it was not his duty to do so, and I will pay this debt of gratitude to assure his peace, by means of this new relationship, but... But what? I will never forget the vows of faithfulness that I have made to you. What are you thinking of doing? asked Ibarra, trying to read the look in her eyes. The future is dark and my destiny is wrapped in gloom. I don't know what I should do. But know that I have loved but once, and that without love I will never belong to any man. And you? What is going to become of you? I am only a fugitive. I am fleeing. In a little while my flight will have been discovered. Maria! 
Maria Clara caught the youth's head in her hands and kissed him repeatedly on the lips, embraced him, and drew abruptly away. Go, go, she cried, go, and farewell. Ibarra gazed at her with shining eyes, but at a gesture from her moved away, intoxicated, wavering. Once again he leaped over the wall and stepped into the banca. Maria Clara, leaning over the balustrade, watched him depart. Elias took off his hat and bowed to her profoundly. End of chapter 60「Chapter 61 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 61 The Chase on the Lake "'Listen, sir, to the plan that I have worked out.' said Elias thoughtfully as they moved in the direction of San Gabriel. I'll hide you now in the house of a friend of mine in Mandaluyong. I'll bring you all your money, which I saved and buried at the foot of the balete in the mysterious tomb of your grandfather. Then you will leave the country. To go abroad? inquired Ibarra. To live out in peace the days of life that remain to you. You have friends in Spain, you are rich, you can get yourself pardoned. In every way a foreign country is for us a better fatherland than our own. Chrysostomo did not answer, but meditated in silence. At that moment they reached the Pasig, and the banca began to ascend the current. Over the bridge of Spain a horseman galloped rapidly, while a shrill, prolonged whistle was heard. Elias, said Ibarra, you owe your misfortunes to my family, you have saved my life twice, and I owe you not only gratitude, but also the restitution of your fortune. You advise me to go abroad. Then come with me, and we will live like brothers. Here you are also wretched. Elias shook his head sadly and answered, Impossible. It's true that I cannot love or be happy in my country, but I can suffer and die in it, and perhaps for it, that is always something. May the misfortunes of my native land be my own misfortunes, and, although no noble sentiment unites us, although our hearts do not beat to a single name, at least may the common calamity bind me to my countrymen, at least may I weep over our sorrows with them, may the same hard fate oppress all our hearts alike. Then why do you advise me to go away? because in some other country you could be happy, while I could not, because you are not made to suffer, and because you would hate your country if some day you should see yourself ruined in its cause, and to hate one's native land is the greatest of calamities. "'You are unfair to me!' exclaimed Ibarra with bitter reproach. "'You forget that scarcely had I arrived here when I set myself to seek its welfare.' "'Don't be offended, sir, I was not reproaching you at all.' would that all of us could imitate you but i do not ask impossibilities of you and i mean no offence when i say that your heart deceives you you loved your country because your father taught you to do so you loved it because in it you had affection fortune youth because everything smiled on you your country had done you no injustice you loved it as we love anything that makes us happy but the day in which you see yourself poor and hungry, persecuted, betrayed, and sold by your own countrymen, on that day you will disown yourself, your country, and all mankind. Your words pain me, said Ibarra resentfully. Elias bowed his head and meditated before replying. I wish to disillusion you, sir, and save you from a sad future. Recall that night when I talked to you in this same banca under the light of this same moon, not a month ago. Then you were happy, the plea of the unfortunates did not touch you, you disdained their complaints because they were the complaints of criminals, you paid more attention to their enemies, and in spite of my arguments and petitions, you placed yourself on the side of their oppressors. On you then depended whether I should turn criminal or allow myself to be killed in order to carry out a sacred pledge, but God has not permitted this because the old chief of the outlaws is dead. A month has hardly passed, and you think otherwise. 
You are right, Elias, but man is a creature of circumstances. Then I was blind, annoyed. What did I know? Now misfortune has torn the bandage from my eyes. The solitude and misery of my prison have taught me. Now I see the horrible cancer which feeds upon this society, which clutches its flesh and which demands a violent rooting out. They have opened my eyes, they have made me see the sore, and they force me to be a criminal. Since they wish it, I will be a filibuster, a real filibuster, I mean. I will call together all the unfortunates, all who feel a heart beat in their breasts, all those who were sending you to me. No, I will not be a criminal, never is he such who fights for his native land, but quite the reverse. We, during three centuries, have extended them our hands, we have asked love of them, we have yearned to call them brothers, and how do they answer us? With insults and jests, denying us even the chance character of human beings. There is no God, there is no hope, there is no humanity, there is nothing but the right of might. Ibarra was nervous, his whole body trembled. As they passed in front of the captain-general's palace, they thought that they should discern movement and excitement among the guards. "'Can they have discovered your flight?' murmured Elias. "'Lie down, sir, so that I can cover you with sacate. Since we shall pass near the powder magazine, it may seem suspicious to the sentinel that there are two of us.' The banka was one of those small, narrow canoes that do not seem to float but rather to glide over the top of the water. As Elias had foreseen, the sentinel stopped him and inquired whence he came. "'From Manila, to carry Zacate to the judges and curates,' he answered, imitating the accent of the people of Pandakan. A sergeant came out to learn what was happening. "'Move on,' he said to Elias. "'But I warn you not to take anybody into your banca. A prisoner has just escaped. If you capture him and turn him over to me, I'll give you a good tip.' All right, sir. What's his description? He wears a sack coat and talks Spanish. So look out. The banker moved away. Elias looked back and watched the silhouette of the sentinel standing on the bank of the river. We'll lose a few minutes' time, he said in a low voice. We must go into the Beata River to pretend that I'm from Peña Francia. You will see the river of which Francisco Baltasar sang. The town slept in the moonlight, and Crisostomo rose up to admire the sepulchral peace of nature. The river was narrow, and the level land on either side covered with grass. Elias threw his cargo out on the bank, and, after removing a large piece of bamboo, took from under the grass some empty palm-leaf sacks. Then they continued on their way. "'You are the master of your own will, sir, and of your future.' he said to Chrysostomo, who had remained silent. But if you will allow me an observation, I would say, think well what you are planning to do. You are going to light the flames of war, since you have money and brains, and you will quickly find many to join you, for unfortunately there are plenty of malcontents. But in this struggle which you are going to undertake, those who will suffer most will be the defenceless and the innocent. The same sentiments that a month ago impelled me to appeal to you asking for reforms are those that move me now to urge you to think well. The country, sir, does not think of separating from the mother country. It only asks for a little freedom, justice and affection. You will be supported by the malcontents, the criminals, the desperate, but the people will hold aloof. You are mistaken if, seeing all dark, you think that the country is desperate. The country suffers, yes, but it still hopes and trusts and will only rebel when it has lost its patience, that is, when those who govern it wish it to do so, and that time is yet distant. I myself will not follow you, never will I resort to such extreme measures, while I see hope in men. Then I'll go on without you, responded Ibarra resolutely. Is your decision final? Final and firm. Let the memory of my mother bear witness. I will not let peace and happiness be torn away from me with impunity, I who desired only what was good, I who have respected everything and endured everything out of love for a hypocritical religion and out of love for country. How have they answered me? 
by burying me in an infamous dungeon and robbing me of my intended wife. No, not to avenge myself would be a crime. It would be encouraging them to new acts of injustice. No, it would be cowardice, pusillanimity, to groan and weep when there is blood and life left, when to insult and menace is added mockery. I will call out these ignorant people. I will make them see their misery. I will teach them to think not of brotherhood, but only that they are wolves for devouring. I will urge them to rise against this oppression and proclaim the eternal right of man to win his freedom. But innocent people will suffer. So much the better. Can you take me to the mountains? Until you are in safety, replied Elias. Again they moved out into the Pasig, talking from time to time of indifferent matters. Santa Ana, murmured Ibarra, do you recognize this building? They were passing in front of the country house of the Jesuits. There I spent many pleasant and happy days, sighed Elias. In my time we came every month. Then I was like others. I had a fortune, family, I dreamed. I looked forward to a future. In those days I saw my sister in the nearby college. She presented me with a piece of her own embroidery work. A friend used to accompany her, a beautiful girl. All that has passed like a dream. They remained silent until they reached Malapat Nabato. Those who have ever made their way by night up the Pasig, on one of those magical nights that the Philippines offers, when the moon pours out from the limpid blue her melancholy light, when the shadows hide the miseries of men and the silence is unbroken by the sordid accents of his voice, when only nature speaks, they will understand the thoughts of both these youths. At Malapat Nabato, the carbineer was sleepy, and, seeing that the banka was empty and offered no booty which he might seize, according to the traditional usage of his corps and the custom of that post, he easily let them pass on. Nor did the civil guard at Pasig suspect anything, so they were not molested. Day was beginning to break when they reached the lake, still and calm like a gigantic mirror. The moon paled and the east was dyed in rosy tints. Some distance away they perceived a grey mass advancing slowly toward them. The police boat is coming, murmured Elias. Lie down and I'll cover you with these sacks. The outlines of the boat became clearer and plainer. It's getting between us and the shore, observed Elias uneasily. Gradually he changed the course of his bunker, rowing toward Binangonan. To his great surprise he noticed that the boat also changed its course, while a voice called to him. Elias stopped rowing and reflected. The shore was still far away and they would soon be within range of the rifles on the police boat. He thought of returning to Pasig, for his bunker was the swifter of the two boats, but unluckily he saw another boat coming from the river and made out the gleam of caps and bayonets of the civil guard. We're caught, he muttered, turning pale. He gazed at his robust arms and, adopting the only course left, began to row with all his might toward Talim Island, just as the sun was rising. The banka slipped rapidly along. Elias saw standing on the boat, which had veered about, some men making signals to him. "'Do you know how to manage a banka? he asked Ibarra. "'Yes. Why? Because we are lost if I don't jump into the water and throw them off the track. They will pursue me, but I swim and dive well. I'll draw them away from you, and then you can save yourself.' "'No. Stay here, and we'll sell our lives dearly. That would be useless.' We have no arms, and with their rifles they would shoot us down like birds. At that instant the water gave forth a hiss, such as is caused by the falling of hot metal into it, followed instantaneously by a loud report. You see, said Elias, placing the paddle in the boat, we'll see each other on Christmas Eve at the tomb of your grandfather. Save yourself. And you? God has carried me safely through greater perils. As Elias took off his camisa, a bullet tore it from his hands, and two loud reports were heard. 
Calmly he clasped the hand of Ibarra, who was still stretched out in the bottom of the banka. Then he arose and leaped into the water, at the same time pushing the little craft away from him with his foot. Cries resounded, and soon, some distance away, the youth's head appeared, as if for breathing, then instantly disappeared. There! There he is! cried several voices, and again the bullets whistled. The police boat and the boat from the Pasig now started in pursuit of him. A light track indicated his passage through the water as he drew farther and farther away from Ibarra's banka, which floated about as if abandoned. Every time the swimmer lifted his head above the water to breathe, the guards in both boats shot at him. So the chase continued. Ibarra's little banka was now far away, and the swimmer was approaching the shore, distant some thirty yards. The rowers were tired, but Elias was in the same condition, for he showed his head oftener, and each time in a different direction, as if to disconcert his pursuers. No longer did the treacherous track indicate the position of the diver. They saw him for the last time when he was some ten yards from the shore, and fired. Then, minute after minute passed, but nothing again appeared above the still and solitary surface of the lake. Half an hour afterwards, one of the rowers claimed that he could distinguish in the water near the shore traces of blood, but his companions shook their heads dubiously. End of chapter 61Chapter 62 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 62. Padre Damaso Explains. Vainly were the rich wedding presents heaped upon a table. Neither the diamonds in their cases of blue velvet, nor the piña embroideries, nor the rolls of silk, drew the gaze of Maria Clara. Without reading or even seeing it, the maiden sat staring at the newspaper, which gave an account of the death of Ibarra, drowned in the lake. Suddenly she felt two hands placed over her eyes to hold her fast, and heard Padre Damaso's voice ask merrily, "'Who am I? Who am I?' Maria Clara sprang from her seat and gazed at him in terror. "'Foolish little girl, you're not afraid, are you? You weren't expecting me, eh? Well, I've come in from the provinces to attend your wedding.' He smiled with satisfaction as he drew nearer to her and held out his hand for her to kiss. Maria Clara approached him tremblingly and touched his hand respectfully to her lips. "'What's the matter with you, Maria?' asked the franciscan losing his merry smile and becoming uneasy your hand is cold you're pale are you ill little girl padre damaso drew her toward himself with a tenderness that one would hardly have thought him capable of and catching both her hands in his questioned her with his gaze don't you have confidence in your godfather any more he asked reproachfully Come, sit down and tell me your little troubles as you used to do when you were a child, when you wanted tapers to make wax dolls. You know that I've always loved you. I've never been cross with you. His voice was now no longer brusque and even became tenderly modulated. Maria Clara began to weep. You're crying, little girl? Why do you cry? Have you quarreled with Linares? Maria Clara covered her ears. "'Don't speak of him, not now!' she cried. Padre Damaso gazed at her in startled wonder. "'Won't you trust me with your secrets? Haven't I always tried to satisfy your lightest whim?' The maiden raised eyes filled with tears and stared at him for a long time, then again fell to weeping bitterly. "'Don't cry so, little girl. Your tears hurt me.' Tell me your troubles and you'll see how your godfather loves you. Maria Clara approached him slowly, fell upon her knees, and, raising her tear-stained face toward his, asked in a low, scarcely audible tone, Do you still love me? 
child then protect my father and break off my marriage here the maiden told of her last interview with ibarra concealing only her knowledge of the secret of her birth padre damaso could scarcely credit his ears while he lived the girl continued i thought of struggling i was hoping trusting i wanted to live so that i might hear of him but now that they have killed him now there is no reason why i should live and suffer she spoke in low measured tones calmly tearlessly but foolish girl isn't linares a thousand times better than while he lived i could have married i thought of running away afterwards my father wants only the relationship but now that he is dead no other man shall call me wife while he was alive i could debase myself for there would have remained the consolation that he lived and perhaps thought of me but now that he is dead the nunnery or the tomb the girl's voice had a ring of firmness in it such that padre damaso lost his merry air and became very thoughtful did you love him as much as that he stammered maria clara did not answer padre damaso dropped his head on his chest and remained silent for a long time daughter in god he exclaimed at length in a broken voice forgive me for having made you unhappy without knowing it i was thinking of your future i desired your happiness how could i permit you to marry a native of the country to see you an unhappy wife and a wretched mother i couldn't get that love out of your head even though i opposed it with all my might i committed wrongs for you solely for you if you had become his wife you would have mourned afterwards over the condition of your husband exposed to all kinds of vexations without means of defence as a mother you would have mourned the fate of your sons if you had educated them you would have prepared for them a sad future for they would have become enemies of religion and you would have seen them garroted or exiled if you had kept them ignorant you would have seen them tyrannized over and degraded i could not consent to it for this reason i sought for you a husband that could make you the happy mother of sons who would command and not obey who would punish and not suffer i knew that the friend of your childhood was good i liked him as well as his father but i have hated them both since i saw that they were going to bring about your unhappiness because i love you i adore you i love you as one loves his own daughter yours is my only affection i have seen you grow not an hour has passed that i have not thought of you i dreamed of you you have been my only joy here padre damaso himself broke out into tears like a child then as you love me don't make me eternally wretched he no longer lives so i want to be a nun the old priest rested his forehead on his hand to be a nun a nun he repeated you don't know child what the life is the mystery that is hidden behind the walls of the nunnery you don't know a thousand times would i prefer to see you unhappy in the world rather than in the cloister here your complaints can be heard there you will have only the walls you are beautiful very beautiful and you were not born for that to be a bride of christ believe me little girl time will wipe away everything later on you will forget you will love you will love your husband linares the nunnery or death the nunnery the nunnery or death exclaimed padre damaso maria i am now an old man i shall not be able much longer to watch over you and your welfare choose something else seek another love some other man whoever he may be anything but the nunnery the nunnery or death my god my god cried the priest covering his head with his hands thou chastisest me so let it be but watch over my daughter then turning again to the young woman he said you wish to be a nun and it shall be so i don't want you to die 
Maria Clara caught both his hands in hers, clasping and kissing them as she fell upon her knees, repeating over and over, My godfather, I thank you, my godfather. With bowed head, Fray Damaso went away, sad and sighing. God, thou dost exist, since thou chastisest. But let thy vengeance fall on me, harm not the innocent. Save thou my daughter. End of chapter 62Chapter 63 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Chapter 63. Christmas Eve. High up on the slope of the mountain, near a roaring stream, a hut built on the gnarled logs hides itself among the trees. Over its cocon thatch clambers the branching gourd wine, laden with flowers and fruit. Deer antlers and skulls of wild boar, some with long tusks, adorn this mountain home, where lives a Tagalog family engaged in hunting and cutting firewood. In the shade of a tree the grand sire was making brooms from the fibres of palm leaves, while a young woman was placing eggs, limes, and some vegetables in a white basket. Two children, a boy and a girl, were playing by the side of another, who, pale and sad, with large eyes and a deep gaze, was seated on a fallen tree trunk. In his thinned features we recognize Cesar's son, Basilio, the brother of Crispin. When your foot gets well, the little girl was saying to him, we'll play hide-and-seek. I'll be the leader. You'll go up to the top of the mountain with us, added the little boy, and drink deer blood with lime juice, and you'll get fat, and then I'll teach you how to jump from rock to rock above the torrent. Basilio smiled sadly, stared at the sore on his foot, and then turned his gaze toward the sun, which shone resplendently. Sell these brooms, said the grandfather to the young woman, and buy something for the children, for tomorrow is Christmas. Firecrackers! I want some firecrackers! exclaimed the boy. I want a head for my doll! cried the little girl, catching hold of her sister's tapis. And you, what do you want? the grandfather asked Basilio, who at the question arose laboriously and approached the old man. Sir, he said, I've been sick more than a month now, haven't I? Since we found your lifeless and covered with wounds, two moons have come and gone. We thought you were going to die. May God reward you, for we are very poor, replied Basilio. But now that tomorrow is Christmas, I want to go to the town to see my mother and my little brother. They will be seeking for me. But, my son, you're not yet well, and your town is far away. You won't get there by midnight. That doesn't matter, sir. My mother and my little brother must be very sad. Every year we spent this holiday together. Last year the three of us had a whole fish to eat. My mother will have been mourning and looking for me. You won't get to the town alive, boy. Tonight we're going to have chicken and wild boar's meat. My sons will ask for you when they come from the field. You have many sons, while my mother has only us two. Perhaps she already believes that I'm dead. Tonight I want to give her a pleasant surprise, a Christmas gift, a son. The old man felt the tears springing up into his eyes, so, placing his hands on the boy's head, he said with emotion, You're like an old man. Go. Look for your mother, give her the Christmas gift, from God, as you say. If I had known the name of your town, I would have gone there when you were sick. Go, my son, and may God and the Lord Jesus go with you. Lucia, my granddaughter, will go with you to the nearest town. What? You're going away? The little boy asked him. Down there are soldiers and many robbers. Don't you want to see my firecrackers? Boom, boom, boom! "'Don't you want to play hide-and-seek?' asked the little girl. "'Have you ever played it? 
Surely there's nothing any more fun than to be chased and hide yourself. Basilio smiled, but with tears in his eyes, and caught up his staff. I'll come back soon, he answered. I'll bring my little brother. You'll see him and play with him. He's just about as big as you are. Does he walk lame too? asked the little girl. Then we'll make him it when we play hide-and-seek. Don't forget us, the old man said to him. Take this dried meat as a present to your mother. The children accompanied him to the bamboo bridge swung over the noisy course of the stream. Lucia made him support himself on her arm, and thus they disappeared from the children's sight, Basilio walking along nimbly in spite of his bandaged leg. The north wind whistled by, making the inhabitants of San Diego shiver with cold. It was Christmas Eve, and yet the town was wrapped in gloom. Not a paper lantern hung from the windows, nor did a single sound in the houses indicate the rejoicing of other years. In the house of Capitan Basilio, he and Don Filippo, for the misfortunes of the latter had made them friendly, were standing by a window grating and talking, while at another were Sinang, her cousin Victoria, and the beautiful Idai, looking toward the street. The waning moon began to shine over the horizon, illuminating the clouds and making the trees and houses cast long, fantastic shadows. "'Yours is not a little good fortune to get off free in these times,' said Capitan Basilio to Don Filippo. "'They've burned your books, yes, but others have lost more.' A woman approached the grating and gazed into the interior. Her eyes glittered, her features were emaciated, her hair loose and dishevelled. The moonlight gave her a weird aspect. Sisa! exclaimed Don Filippo in surprise. Then, turning to Capitan Basilio, as the madwoman ran away, he asked, Wasn't she in the house of a physician? Has she been cured? Capitan Basilio smiled bitterly. The physician was afraid they would accuse him of being a friend of Don Crisostomo's, so he drove her from his house. Now she wanders about again as crazy as ever, singing, harming no one, and living in the woods. What else has happened in the town since we left it? I know that we have a new curate and another alferez. These are terrible times. Humanity is retrograding, murmured Capitan Basilio, thinking of the past. The day after you left, they found the senior sacristan dead, hanging from a rafter in his own house. Padre Salvi was greatly affected by his death and took possession of all his papers. Ah, yes, the old sage, Tassio, also died and was buried in the Chinese cemetery. Poor old man, sighed Don Filippo. What became of his books? <laughs> they were burned by the pious who thought thus to please God. I was unable to save anything, not even Cicero's works. The gobernadorcillo did nothing to prevent it. Both became silent. At that moment the sad and melancholy song of the madwoman was heard. Do you know when Maria Clara is to be married? Idai asked Sinang. I don't know, answered the latter. I received a letter from her, but haven't opened it for fear of finding out. Poor Crisostomo? They say that if it were not for Linares, they would hang Capitan Tiago. So what was Maria Clara going to do? observed Victoria. A boy limped by, running toward the plaza, whence came the notes of Caesar's song. It was Basilio, who had found his home deserted and in ruins. After many inquiries, he had only learned that his mother was insane and wandering about the town. Of Crispin, not a word. Basilio choked back his tears, stifled any expression of his sorrow, and without resting had started in search of his mother. On reaching the town, he was just asking about her when her song struck his ears. The unhappy boy overcame the trembling in his limbs and ran to throw himself into his mother's arms. The madwoman left the plaza and stopped in front of the house of the new alferez. Now, as formerly, there was a sentinel before the door, and a woman's head appeared at the window. 
only it was not the Medusa's, but that of a comely young woman, alferes and unfortunate are not synonymous terms. Sisa began to sing before the house, with her gaze fixed on the moon, which soared majestically in the blue heavens among golden clouds. Basilio saw her, but did not dare to approach her. Walking back and forth, but taking care not to get near the barracks, he waited for the time when she would leave that place. The young woman, who was at the window listening attentively to the madwoman's song, ordered the sentinel to bring her inside, but when Sisa saw the soldier approach her and heard his voice, she was filled with terror and took to flight at a speed of which only a demented person is capable. Basilio, fearing to lose her, ran after her, forgetful of the pains in his feet. "'Look how that boy is chasing the madwoman!' indignantly exclaimed the woman in the street. Seeing that he continued to pursue her, she picked up a stone and threw it at him, saying, "'Take that! It's a pity that the dog is tied up!' Basilio felt a blow on his head, but paid no attention to it as he continued running. Dogs barked, geese cackled, several windows opened to let out curious faces, but quickly closed again from fear of another night of terror. Soon they were outside of the town. Sisa began to moderate her flight, but still a great distance separated her from her pursuer. Mother! he called to her when he caught sight of her. Scarcely had the madwoman heard his voice when she again took to flight. Mother, it's I! cried the boy in desperation, but the madwoman did not heed him, so he followed panting. They had now passed the cultivated fields and were near the wood. Basilio saw his mother enter it, and he also went in. The bushes and shrubs, the thorny vines and projecting roots of trees, hindered the movements of both. The sun followed his mother's shadowy form as it was revealed from time to time by the moonlight that penetrated through the foliage and into the open spaces. They were in the mysterious wood of the Ibarra family. The boy stumbled and fell several times, but rose again, each time without feeling pain. All his soul was centered in his eyes, following the beloved figure. They crossed a sweetly murmuring brook where sharp thorns of bamboo that had fallen on the sand at its margin pierced his bare feet, but he did not stop to pull them out. To his great surprise he saw that his mother had plunged into the thick undergrowth and was going through the wooden gateway that opened into the tomb of the old Spaniard at the foot of the balete. Basilio tried to follow her in, but found the gate fastened. The madwoman defended the entrance with her emaciated arms and dishevelled head, holding the gate shut with all her might. "'Mother, it's I, it's I! I'm Basilio, your son!' cried the boy as he let himself fall weakly. But the madwoman did not yield. Bracing herself with her feet on the ground, she offered an energetic resistance. Basilio beat the gate with his fists, with his blood-stained head, he wept, but in vain. Painfully he arose and examined the wall, thinking to scale it, but found no way to do so. He then walked around it and noticed that a branch of the fateful balete was crossed with one from another tree. This he climbed and, his filial love working miracles, made his way from branch to branch to the balete, from which he saw his mother still holding the gate shut with her head. The noise made by him among the branches attracted Sisa's attention. She turned and tried to run, but her son, letting himself fall from the tree, caught her in his arms and covered her with kisses, losing consciousness as he did so. Sisa saw his blood-stained forehead and bent over him. Her eyes seemed to start from her sockets as she peered into his face. Those pale features stirred the sleeping cells of her brain so that something like a spark of intelligence flashed up in her mind and she recognized her son. With a terrible cry she fell upon the insensible body of the boy, embracing and kissing him. Mother and son remained motionless. When Basilio recovered consciousness he found his mother lifeless. He called to her with the tenderest names but she did not awake. 
noticing that she was not even breathing he arose and went to the neighbouring brook to get some water in a banana leaf with which to rub the pallid face of his mother but the madwoman made not the least movement and her eyes remained closed basilio gazed at her in terror he placed his ear over her heart but the thin faded breast was cold and her heart no longer beat he put his lips to hers but felt no breathing the miserable boy threw his arms about the corpse and wept bitterly. The moon gleamed majestically in the sky, the wandering breezes sighed, and down in the grass the crickets chirped. The night of light and joy for so many children who in the warm bosom of the family celebrate this feast of sweetest memories, the feast which commemorates the first look of love that heaven sent to earth, this night, when in all Christian families they eat, drink, dance, sing, laugh, play, caress, and kiss one another, this night, which in cold countries holds such magic for childhood, with its traditional pine tree covered with lights, dolls, candies, and tinsel, whereon gaze the round, staring eyes in which innocence alone is reflected, this night brought to Basilio only orphanhood. Who knows but that perhaps in the home whence came the taciturn Padre Salvi children also played, perhaps they sang, La noche buena se viene, la noche buena se va. For a long time the boy wept and moaned. When at last he raised his head, he saw a man standing over him, gazing at the scene in silence. Are you Hassan? asked the unknown in a low voice. The boy nodded. What do you expect to do? Bury her. In the cemetery? I haven't any money, and besides, the curate wouldn't allow it. Then... If you would help me... I'm very weak, answered the unknown as he sank slowly to the ground, supporting himself with both hands. I'm wounded. For two days I haven't eaten or slept. Has no one come here tonight? The man thoughtfully contemplated the attractive features of the boy, then went on in a still weaker voice. Listen, I too shall be dead before the day comes. Twenty paces from here, on the other side of the brook, there is a big pile of firewood. Bring it here, make a pyre, put our bodies upon it, cover them over, and set fire to the hole. Fire until we are reduced to ashes." Basilio listened attentively. Afterwards, if no one comes, dig here. You will find a lot of gold, and it will be all yours. Take it and go to school. The voice of the unknown was becoming every moment more unintelligible. Go, get the firewood. I want to help you. As Basilio moved away, the unknown turned his face toward the east and murmured as though praying, I die without seeing the dawn brighten over my native land. You who have it to see, welcome it, and forget not those who have fallen during the night. He raised his eyes to the sky, and his lips continued to move as if uttering a prayer. Then he bowed his head and sank slowly to the earth. Two hours later, Sister Rufa was on the back veranda of her house, making her morning ablutions in order to attend Mass. The pious woman gazed at the adjacent wood and saw a thick column of smoke rising from it. Filled with holy indignation, she knitted her eyebrows and exclaimed, "'What heretic is making a clearing on a whole day? That's why so many calamities come. You ought to go to purgatory and see if you could get out of there, savage!' End of chapter 63《エピローグ of The Social Cancer》A Complete English Version of《ノリメタンガレ》From the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in February 2012. Epilogue since some of our characters are still living and others have been lost sight of, a real epilogue is impossible. 
for the satisfaction of the groundlings we should gladly kill off all of them beginning with padre salvi and ending with doña victorina but this is not possible let them live anyhow the country not ourselves has to support them after maria clara entered the nunnery padre damaso left his town to live in manila as did also padre salvi who while he awaits a vacant mitre preaches sometimes in the church of saint clara in whose nunnery he discharges the duties of an important office not many months had passed when padre damaso received an order from the very reverend father provincial to occupy a curacy in a remote province it is related that he was so grievously affected by this that on the following day he was found dead in his bedchamber some said that he had died of an apoplectic stroke others of a nightmare but his physician dissipated all doubts by declaring that he had died suddenly none of our readers would now recognize capitan tiago weeks before maria clara took the vows he fell into a state of depression so great that he grew sad and thin and became pensive and distrustful like his former friend capitan tinong as soon as the doors of the nunnery closed he ordered his disconsolate cousin aunt isabel to collect whatever had belonged to his daughter and his dead wife and to go to make her home in malabon or san diego since he wished to live alone thenceforward he then devoted himself passionately to liampo and the cockpit and began to smoke opium he no longer goes to antipolo nor does he order any more masses so doña patrocinia his old rival celebrates her triumph piously by snoring during the sermons if at any time during the late afternoon you should walk along calle santo cristo you would see seated in a chinese shop a small man yellow thin and bent with stained and dirty fingernails gazing through dreamy sunken eyes at the passers-by as if he did not see them at nightfall you would see him rise with difficulty and supporting himself on his cane make his way to a narrow little by-street to enter a grimy building over the door of which may be seen in large red letters fumadero publico de anfion this is that capitan tiago who was so celebrated but who is now completely forgotten even by the very senior sacristan himself Doña Victorina has added to her false frizzes and to her Andalusization, if we may be permitted the term, the new custom of driving the carriage horses herself, obliging Don Tiburcio to remain quiet. Since many unfortunate accidents occurred on account of the weakness of her eyes, she has taken to wearing spectacles, which give her a marvellous appearance. The doctor has never been called upon again to attend anyone, and the servants see him many days in the week without teeth, which, as our readers know, is a very bad sign. Linares, the only defender of the hapless doctor, has long been addressed in Paco's cemetery, the victim of dysentery and the harsh treatment of his cousin-in-law. The victorious Alferez returned to Spain a major, leaving his amiable spouse in her flannel camisa, the colour of which is now indescribable. The poor Ariadne, finding herself thus abandoned, also devoted herself, as did the daughter of Minos, to the cult of Bacchus and the cultivation of tobacco. She drinks and smokes with such fury that now not only the girls, but even the old women and little children fear her. Probably our acquaintances of the town of San Diego are still alive, if they did not perish in the explosion of the steamer Lipa, which was making a trip to the province. Since no one bothered himself to learn who the unfortunates were that perished in that catastrophe, or to whom belonged the legs and arms left neglected on Convalescence Island and the banks of the river, we have no idea whether any acquaintance of our readers was among them or not. Along with the government and the press at the time, we are satisfied with the information that the only friar who was on the steamer was saved, and we do not ask for more. The principal thing for us is the existence of the virtuous priests, whose reign in the Philippines may God conserve for the good of our souls. Of Maria Clara, nothing more is known except that the sepulchre seems to guard her in its bosom. 
we have asked several persons of great influence in the holy nunnery of saint clara but no one has been willing to tell us a single word not even the talkative devotees who receive the famous fried chicken livers and the even more famous sauce known as that of the nuns prepared by the intelligent cook of the virgins of the lord nevertheless on a night in september the hurricane raged over manila lashing the buildings with its gigantic wings the thunder crashed continuously lightning flashes momentarily revealed the havoc wrought by the blast and threw the inhabitants into wild terror the rain fell in torrents each flash of the forked lightning showed a piece of roofing or a window blind flying through the air to fall with a horrible crash not a person or a carriage moved through the streets when the hoarse reverberations of the thunder a hundred times re-echoed lost themselves in the distance there was heard the sowing of the wind as it drove the raindrops with a continuous tick-tack against the concha panes of the closed windows two patrol men sheltered themselves under the eaves of a building near the nunnery one a private and the other a distinguido what's the use of our staying here said the private no one is moving about the streets we ought to get into a house my querida lives in calle arzobispo from here over there is quite a distance and we'll get wet answered the distinguido what does that matter just so the lightning doesn't strike us bah don't worry the nuns surely have a lightning rod to protect them yes observed the private but of what use is it when the night is so dark as he said this he looked upward to stare into the darkness at that moment a prolonged streak of lightning flashed followed by a terrific roar naco sus mariosep exclaimed the private crossing himself and catching hold of his companion let's get away from here what's happened come come away from here he repeated with his teeth rattling from fear what have you seen a spectre he murmured trembling with fright a spectre on the roof there it must be the nun who practices magic during the night the distinguido thrust his head out to look just as a flash of lightning furrowed the heavens with a vein of fire and sent a horrible crash earthwards jesus he exclaimed also crossing himself in the brilliant glare of the celestial light he had seen a white figure standing almost on the ridge of the roof with arms and face raised toward the sky as if praying to it the heavens responded with lightning and thunderbolts as the sound of the thunder rolled away a sad plaint was heard that's not the wind it's the spectre murmured the private as if in response to the pressure of his companion's head ay ay came through the air rising above the noise of the rain nor could the whistling wind drown that sweet and mournful voice charged with affliction again the lightning flashed with dazzling intensity no it's not a spectre exclaimed the distinguido i've seen her before she's beautiful like the virgin let's get away from here and report it the private did not wait for him to repeat the invitation and both disappeared who was moaning in the middle of the night in spite of the wind and rain and storm who was the timid maiden the bride of christ who defied the unchained elements and chose such a fearful night under the open sky to breathe forth from so perilous a height her complaints to god had the lord abandoned his altar in the nunnery so that he no longer heard her supplications did its arches perhaps prevent the longings of the soul from rising up to the throne of the most merciful the tempest raged furiously nearly the whole night nor did a single star shine through the darkness the despairing plaints continued to mingle with the sowing of the wind but they found nature and man alike deaf god had hidden himself and heard not on the following day after the dark clouds had cleared away and the sun shone again brightly in the limpid sky there stopped at the door of the nunnery of saint clara a carriage from which alighted a man who made himself known as a representative of the authorities 
he asked to be allowed to speak immediately with the abbess and to see all the nuns. It is said that one of these, who appeared in a gown all wet and torn, with tears and tales of horror begged the man's protection against the outrages of hypocrisy. It is also said that she was very beautiful and had the most lovely and expressive eyes that were ever seen. The representative of the authorities did not accede to her request, but, after talking with the abbess, left her there in spite of her tears and pleadings. The youthful nun saw the door close behind him as a condemned person might look upon the portals of heaven closing against him, if ever heaven should come to be as cruel and unfeeling as men are. The abbess said that she was a madwoman. The man may not have known that there is in Manila a home for the demented, or perhaps he looked upon the nunnery itself as an insane asylum, although it is claimed that he was quite ignorant, especially in a matter of deciding whether a person is of sound mind. It is also reported that General J. thought otherwise when the matter reached his ears. He wished to protect the madwoman and asked for her. But this time no beautiful and unprotected maiden appeared, nor would the abbess permit a visit to the cloister, forbidding it in the name of religion and the holy statutes. Nothing more was said of the affair, nor of the ill-starred Maria Clara. End of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. Thanks for listening.